I call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for March 6, 2018. I invite you to rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance uh, to the flag led by Noreen Bodwe from uh, per Perry Hall, no, from freshman, a freshman from Towson High, and Manya Carr, a senior from Perry Hall. After uh, the pledge, please remain standing for a moment of silence and recognition of those who have served education. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the United for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The first item on our agenda is to consider the agenda. Ms. White, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? Mr. Chair, there are no changes or additions. Hearing none, is there a motion to adopt the agenda? Moved. Is there a second? second? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, that motion carries. Thank you. Uh, uh, next is um, uh, sign up. Sign up cards were available to the public prior to the meeting for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10 the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. Uh, the completed sign up cards for this evening have been placed in the box to my right, and the first 10 drawn from the box will be our speakers for tonight during the public comment portion of the meeting. Ms. Schaefer is going to draw. Mr. Stort is going to read. Attempt to. Uh, the first speaker is Amanda DeLeo. Second speaker is Hillary Martel or Martel. Our third speaker is Rachel Freeman. Fourth speaker is Pete Holder or Holden. Our fifth is Diana Bergman. Six is Gina Strauss. Seven is Mr. Jim Malia. Eight is Brenda Pfeiffer. Nine is Rachel Lynn. And ten is Elizabeth Hembling. Very good. Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. Uh, the members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. Uh, while we encourage public input on policy programs and practices within the purview of this board uh, and the system, uh, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters. Uh, we encourage everyone to utilize existing uh, processes as appropriate. Um, I ask you to observe the three-minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. Uh, please uh, conclude your remarks when you hear the bell or see the time has expired. Um, so first, we're going to start with uh, advisory and stakeholder groups. Uh, but first, I'd like to recognize that uh, Councilman Marks was in the audience, and we thank Councilman Marks for uh, his attendance. Um, our first uh, speaker is the Baltimore County Student Council, a Representative Jake Turner. Um, good evening, board. My name is Jake Turner, and I'm the president of the Baltimore County Student Councils, and I'm joined today by... I'm Carter Bohart. I am the middle school liaison of the Baltimore County Student Council. Um, so first, I would like to thank the Board of Education for taking the time to meet with members of BCSC before this meeting started. Um, I'm incredibly grateful to have a board that listens to our concerns as students and uh, hears our and values our opinions. Um, we had a great conversation about school safety threats, improved safety measures in schools, and mental health resources that need to be available for students. Um, just to recap, as students, we are demanding change so that we can feel safer in our schools. We would like to see the lockdown drills be revamped to ensure that every school is getting what they need um, out of the drill. This is not a joke. No longer should the school, or no longer should the door be closed during a lockdown drill and teachers continue to teach. 
Drills are serious and important and need to be treated as such. Um, additionally, we need more mental health resources available to students, uh, such as additional school counselors, and need to recognize that mental health is more important than our grades. Um, as a school system, we need to make an effort to help students that are struggling with any mental health need. Um, I would also like to thank Josie Schaefer for all of her hard work representing students. You've done a great job, and we're so thankful to have you. Um, tomorrow, unless there's a snow delay, no. Um, no, 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 no. <laughs> which I feel like happens a lot with BCSC events, um, but we have a lot of students from Baltimore County traveling down to Annapolis to speak to representatives um, at the Maryland government level. We are so excited to share our point of view on upcoming bills pertaining to students. So I'm gonna just go over some of our opinions since I have a minute left. Um, so we will be lobbying in support of House Bill 30, which seeks to encourage counties to add age appropriate lessons on domestic violence into school curriculums. House Bill 281, which wants to extend computer science education into every public high school. Senate Bill 236, which wants to develop an elective course to be offered in public schools, which teaches financial literacy. House Bill 251, which requests that consent be added into the health curriculum. And finally, House Bill 1, uh, 1373, which wishes to replace the park test with the CAT test as our public school assessment. Um, there are a few other bills that we're gonna be in support of, but those are all that I'm sharing today. Um, and I'll report back uh, of how it goes, hopefully. Thank you. Thank you both, and thanks for joining us for dinner this evening. Uh, our next speaker is from Tabco, Abby Baton. Ms. Baton. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Vice Chairman Stewart, Ms. White, and members of the board. They are calling for a mix of wintry weather, but we hopefully will be lucky, get mostly rain, and not miss any more time. With only 10 hours left built into the schedule, it is really tight. I know you have deferred the contract on devices for tonight. This is problematic for the teachers, which I will explain shortly. As you wrestle with the topic of devices for staff and students, I will tell you my teachers are of differing opinions when it comes to the student devices. There are those who think they are wonderful and have added depth and capabilities to reach students in their classrooms. There are those who think we should not have a device for each child, and there are some who feel we need to be somewhere in between. There are other important issues in this contract that must be addressed as well. In this contract are the new devices for staff. The old device contract is over beginning with the next school year. If there is no new contract, the teachers, principals, and all the staff who have them now will be left without any. These new devices were picked by a large team with many teachers from across levels, subjects, and positions within the county. TABCO members provided information and helped decide which device would, be best, would best serve the needs of our staff and our students. The devices for teachers have larger screens and many of the changes teachers have requested. The devices for the students, although smaller than the teacher devices, can be used as they are now to interact with the teacher devices. Your deferment of this contract causes a conflict with the teacher's master agreement, which has a clause that requires a field test of technology at least one marking period in advance of its required use by teachers. This is to ensure that teachers have sufficient time to learn the new device, but also that any kinks can be worked out in advance of their required use. The deadline for this device to be in the hands of teachers is fast approaching. The third marking period ends on March 29th. If this contract is delayed, the teachers will not have the device in time and the master agreement will be broken. If the contract does not go forward at all, the teachers will have no devices to use next year because the current devices which are leased will have to be returned. The cost to renew them, even for a year, would be greater than the new ones because the new devices are approximately 30% less expensive than the old outdated devices. Teachers cannot do their work without their devices. They will not be able to answer emails, access curriculum, work on their grade books, and the list goes on and on. Technology is, is here whether we agree with it or not. We must manage it well, but to delay or deny the teachers, principals, and other staff members the use of a device is unimaginable in today's world. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Baton. Our next speaker is from Special Education Citizens Advisory Committee, Megan Stewart Sicking.
Chairman Gillis, Vice Chairman Stewart, Ms. White, the board, good evening to everyone. Good evening. Last night was our annual CCAC meeting on literacy, and I'd like to share a little about it. First, I would like to thank Rebecca Ryder and the Office of Special Ed staff for their initiatives. We continue to be happy about the collaborative learning communities for IEP chairpersons, special educators, reading specialists, and department chairs. We believe this intentional collaboration is incredibly important. And we are also happy to hear about continued progress in training for both Letters and Orton Gillingham. We also thank Beth George, OT team leader, and Kama Dwyer from Assistive Technology for sharing resources with us. I want to particularly emphasize the importance of continuing to discuss dysgraphia, its identification and interventions. When we talk about the importance of writing across content areas, obviously delays in dysgraphia intervention can lead to delays in development of more advanced writing skills. This issue deserves more attention, and we hope to continue to follow up on dysgraphia over the next year. Last night, we were also excited to hear from Dr. Fran Bowman, who shared some information about Orton-Gillingham training and led us in a very interesting uh, experiential exercise. We are in the midst of a five-year Orton-Gillingham contract, which you approved last year. And I want to confirm the incredible importance of what you did in helping to provide this resource for dyslexic students. It works. I also want to note what a pleasure it was to hear from Principal Kelly O'Connell from Mars Estates Elementary. We always enjoy hearing about how administrators and teachers make the best use of resources, and she provided some fantastic examples of how what is being learned and discussed in principal's meetings can be used to make a huge difference in individual schools. On a final note, I'd like to say a word about the next budget. When the Office of Special Ed submits their, bu their budget requests, in my opinion, they are not asking for what they want or what they need. They try to ask for what is reasonable, given a limited amount of resources and many competing needs. However, if we already start with less than what we need in the request, and items get cut from the budget requests, then we get increasingly farther from needing the needs of our students. Whether we're talking about special educators, BCBAs, transition facilitators, or any other number of requests, I implore you, to protect what is left in the budget at this point in the process and do everything possible to give us the human resources we need to work with our students. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is from the PTA Council of Baltimore County, Leslie Weber. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Vice Chair Stu Stewart, Ms. White, and members of the Board of Ed. PTA Council has testified many times about STAT. We have shared concerns about the appropriateness of this type of learning, its massive costs and opportunity costs, and the safety of using devices. We offer testimony in Annapolis on Friday in support of HB 1110 for MSDE in consultation with the Maryland Department of Health to draft guidelines for the safe use of digital devices in Maryland classrooms. OSHA has guidelines for adults in the workplace. Students do not. Tonight, you're scheduled or were scheduled to vote on a new $140 million seven-year contract with daily computers to lease 133,000 new devices for students and staff. This is on top of the nearly 163 million apparently already spent on devices so far, device leases so far. This 300 million doesn't include the millions and millions already spent and slated to be spent on infrastructure, professional development, and digital curricula costs. Those related costs are difficult to tease out because they're embedded in nearly every line item of the budget. This new contract replaces the first seven-year daily contract signed in 2014 for $205 million. That amount was supposed to carry BCPS through to fiscal year 2021, but after less than four and a half years, the entire spending authority of $205 million will have been spent. Four year, years from now, will we again have spent down this new seven-year contract only to have to sign another contract sooner than planned? It's concerning that the new contract is again with daily, despite 
ongoing issues with broken devices, technical service problems, and extremely high device costs. The per device cost under the first contract was estimated to be between $1,400 and $1,600. In other districts, one-to-one -one devices and intensive screen-based learning are not considered de developmentally appropriate. Devices are available on carts when needed at a student-to-device ratio of two to one or three to one, also as recommended by MSDE. We've heard some teachers say that first or second graders are on the, on the devices for an hour or so a day. That's great in terms of age appropriateness, but it's the height of fiscal irresponsibility to then say that each child needs his or her own device. They should be shared. In light of these exorbitant costs and truly lackluster test results, a reanalysis of STAT and an independent special review audit are needed before this $140 million spending authority is approved. Think of what's needed to assure equitab equitable facilities, to increase school safety, to address mental health and discipline issues, and to support an increasingly impoverished student population. Think of the true basic needs of our students in schools before you vote to spend another $140 million on devices. Thank you. Our next speaker is from the Citizens Advisory Committee for Gifted and Talented Education, Julie miller breitz Good evening, Chairman Gillis, board members, Ms. White, and the BCPS community. February was celebrated as Gifted and Talented Education Month, as it has been so designated in the state for many years. On February 21st, the Maryland State Department of Education and the Maryland Advisory Council on Gifted and Talented Education held a ceremony to honor a variety of individuals for their efforts and accomplishments in gifted education. From students to teachers, to program coordinators and school administrators, to individuals who have worked hard on supporting and advancing the field of gifted education, 116 awards were distributed at this ceremony. It was a proud night as I was one of the six recipients for an award that honored individuals <laughs> who support gifted and talented education, thank you, um, regarding the work I've done in my capacity as the chair of the GTCAC. Another GTCAC member, Marlena Colleton Pearsall, was honored as an outstanding educator in gifted education for the work she does as a teacher in Anne Arundel County. A Pikesville Middle School student also won a second place award for an essay contest in which he wrote about what gifted education options have meant to him. It was humbling to receive an award, but more humbling yet was to see how few awards Baltimore County was recognized with, given our size and the dedication of many individuals in the GT arena. In 2018, Baltimore County received 1.72% of the total awards given, and we also had very similar results in 2017 and 2016. I have to wonder why Baltimore County is so poorly represented at this awards event, as I know that there are many other people in the county who are as deserving as I am, and probably more deserving, of recognition for their efforts in gifted and talented education. We need to better amplify these awards and actively seek out and nominate those who are doing great work. I think back to the meeting the GTCAC had with Superintendent White in December in which he told our group about that she believes that there has been too much silence about advanced academics and that it is time to break that silence and build more capacity in this academic area. How better to do this than to recognize, amplify, and cheerlead for all the people throughout the BCPS system who are making positive contributions in gifted and talented education. So to all the parents, teachers, principals, BCPS staff and administration and Board of Education members who are listening tonight, I challenge you to think about those who you know are knocking it out of the park and take action to nominate them for the 2019 GT Awards. Nominations are due in late fall, so you have plenty of time to get going. Forms are easily found on the MSDE website on their Gifted and Talented page. If you're interested in learning more about Gifted and Talented Education or becoming more involved, then we invite you to our upcoming meetings. We have one tomorrow, March 7th at 7 p.m. at Perry Hall Middle School, where we will be listening to parents talking about their experiences with advanced academics. Our April 4th meeting will be focused on opportunities that exist for Gifted and Talented and students in the career and technology education pathway, and our May 2nd meeting will be focused on twice exceptionality. Both of these meetings will be here at Greenwood beginning at 7 p.m. Perfect, perfect. Uh, next are two speakers uh, from the Area Education Advisory Councils. First from the Northeast, Christina Pumphrey. Ms. Pumphrey? Up. Oh. Oops. Um, the the way. Yes. Stay here. Sorry. 
dear BOE members, sorry for the traffic. In the, yes, my name is Lily Li, Northeast area, and we have a local area, uh, Pangoro Middle, PTSA president, Christina Pumphrey today. Talk about her. Uh, Hi. ST. I'm asking that you continue delaying approval of the daily computers contract. Before approving this contract, a new analysis of the STAT program should be completed in addition to the completion of an outside audit. Daly was the same provider of the Revolve laptops, which have continued problems. Broken devices, service problems throughout the county, lack of adequate filters to stop students from visiting inappropriate sites, downloading porn, unfortunately, and sharing inappropriate pictures. It is now becoming well known to parents and other stakeholders that BCPS has already significantly overspent on, on the STAT initiative and approval of this contract is sure to produce, produce additional overspending. Overspending in a time when safety in our schools is a major concern, when our schools are in, are in dire need of increases in school staffing and building improvements and new school buildings. That is where budget money should be spent. I witnessed device use in the classroom firsthand this year during American Education Week visits to Carver Center and Pine Grove Middle with both of my daughters, and the difference was astounding. At Carver Center, which is not one-to-one, -one, I saw excellent and efficient use of devices. Students spent maybe 15 minutes of a 90-minute classroom, a class time on the devices to complement instruction. There was no need for each student to have a device. This is how devices should be used at the elementary school level. At Pine Grove Middle, it was a whole different story. Students use their devices for most of the class. I easily observed four students in one class alone on inappropriate websites, and that's just what I personally observed. As PTSA president at Pie Grove, I have had numerous parents reach out to me about their many concerns, including student access to inappropriate sites, viewing inappropriate pictures, and downloading porn, and this was all during the school day. It is obvious to a majority of parents that the implementation of STAT as it is now was a huge mistake. The program needs to be reanalyzed before approval of a $140 million contract. Our voices weren't heard when the initiative first began, and our voices aren't being heard now, and that is extremely frustrating. We hear over and over again with the stakeholder survey, for instance, that you want to hear from us, yet the consensus amongst the parents is that we are not being heard. It's so frustrating, it's actually infuriating, and frankly, I'm fed up with it. I, t I will tell you this evening that if this contract is approved, I will not sign any paperwork next year for either of my daughters to um, take devices home. And I have supported many other parents who agree to do the same. We have about six months until the beginning of the next school year, and if this contract is approved without further analysis of STAT, I will fight with all I have to inform parents of the numerous problems and waste of money that STAT involves. I encourage parents to refuse to sign paperwork at the beginning of the year for the devices. I will continue to push this initiative on social media and through any means I can to make sure our voices are finally heard. I won't make the mistake of signing that paperwork again, and I'll do the best I can to make sure that other parents don't make the same mistake, because I, for one, am sick and tired of not being heard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our, our next speaker is from the Southeast Area um, Advisory Council, Sandra Skordalos. Is that close? Skordalos. Skordalos, excuse me. <coughs> Sorry about that. Good evening. As a proud Dundalk High School graduate, I've chosen to remain in the Dundalk area. Many of our parents struggle each and every day to provide the basic needs for their children. At Patapsco, we are currently at 55% reported farms. Our students desire the same opportunities to play sports and participate in other extracurricular activities. To do so for our students often puts a burden on their families who may need these young adults to work or to tend to younger siblings while they can work afternoon and night shifts, sometimes in addition to their day shifts. For these wage earning parents, to not work means to not make money. As I sponsor, as I sponsor several organizations at Patapsco High School, I struggle each time a team such as mock trial needs to get to an event. I am personally forbidden from driving students to events and my parents are often unable to do so. My principal is unable to fund transportation since his budget gets cut every year and is nearly half of what it was five years ago. I have brought this equity concern to zone superintendents only to be told that I could get a CDL license and drive my students on a Baltimore County school bus. Soak that in for a minute. That's their solution. Not let us see if, if we can get money in the budget to cover, to change this policy, or allow me to drive students to change the policy, allow me to drive students with my Class C license for which I have 40 years experience. 
Additionally, Jackie Brewster and I together have been requesting work be done at Patapsco High School for over nine years together, and I personally have been doing so for at least 18 years. As a matter of fact, the reason I joined the Southeast Area Educational Advisory Council was my desire to address the number of trailers on Patapsco's campus. We started with one next to the gym and ended with 13, or maybe 15, I'm not sure. During this time, the trailers multiplied. I was told that if Patapsco needed, if, if Patapsco wanted to have a magnet program, that, would that we would just need to deal with having trailers, as if having a magnet program was an option. Ask all the principals I served under if that was an option, and I'm sure it would be an emphatic no. Again, wouldn't the logical answer be, let's build an addition for Patapsco High School and Center for the Arts, because they have had temporary, cl temporary classrooms for 20 years, 18 of which I have complained about them. In 2008, we even got close to getting an addition. Engineers came out and made drawings and spoke to stakeholders only to have that pulled out from under us. So over the past few years, we were presented again with an opportunity to address some of the inadequate conditions of our school. The Southeast Area Educational Advisory Council was opposed to settling for renovations and asked for a new school. Our cries went unheard and what we received were renovations that would not address overcrowding. At the, end of, at the end of these renovations, we will have 16 classroom trailers. Jackie and I have been told on numerous occasions from board members and school system members alike that our protests were not heard because we did not have parents come to these meetings to have their voices heard. Let me back up to the beginning of my story. My parents can't help me transport their, their children to events that they would like to see. Would it be appropriate for me as a classroom teacher to not address the needs of, of students whose parents can't come see me when there's a, an, an issue? I, I think not. Isn't it your responsibility to look, at, look out for all students in BCPS and not just the ones who speak the loudest? Thank you. Next is time for public comment. And our first speaker is Amanda DeLeo. Hi. Good evening, board. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yep. Um, my name's Amanda DeLeo, and I'm the parent of a Baltimore County Public School first grader. I have a wide variety of concerns about the devices that are currently being used that range from time being spent per day on the device, which I have no idea about um, because it's not transparent to me as a parent, to the ease of getting off task. I have contacted all of you about my safety concerns regarding internet use in the elementary grades. I do not know at what age browsing the internet internet is acceptable, but I do know it's not first grade. I can't think of a single reason the children would need more access to resources than what is provided by BCPS1. But with web browser enabled software, what is to stop a child from doing exactly that? I've been assured that the links to the browsers that are on my child's desktop right now will be removed in the next few weeks. There are still browsers on the computer, but they won't be a single click away anymore. This is just the start of what needs to be done. Once the leaks are gone, the child can still freely access the internet by simply typing into the browser bar. When I asked about internet safety at the school, I was told it's my first grader's job to stay on task and only click on what is instructed. He did, after all, sign a digital citizenship agreement. Yeah, hilarious. Um, now I'm all flustered, uh, and that they have filters in place to protect the children from the things they shouldn't be seeing. But the filters don't really filter out everything inappropriate, which is something even the teachers and the internet person at school, the IT professional, did not know. I suspect the filters filter out the worst of the worst, but there's a big gap between porn and what's acceptable for my six-year-old to see at school. Who is protecting my child from the harmful content that doesn't quite register as porn? Using the filters as they are currently in place and fully operational, it took me on my son's computer less than two minutes to get to an article titled, Kim Kardashian Blows RJ, just by typing Kim in the browser search wind window, because it autofills with whatever is common. Not common to the school, but publicly common. So whatever the people are, are searching comes up and a full page article of titles and pictures on the latest issue of National Geographic. I sent you a link to what I saw. I was told these are only thumbnails and that my child can't get to the full article, but I can assure you that thumbnail is not the actual size of the picture. It's much larger than a human thumbnail, plenty of detail. It's highly inappropriate. 
What I've come to understand again is that the worst of the worst may be filtered, but who is protecting my child from that which does not fully get filtered out as porn? It can't be my teacher. There are 24 kids in the room. She cannot possibly watch every single one of them. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Next speaker is Hillary Martell. Hillary Martell. Good evening. My name is Hillary Martell, and I'm a parent of two elementary age kids in Baltimore County Schools. And I'm here today to ask you to reject the funding of $140 million for more student devices. As a parent of young children, I have worked very hard to create an atmosphere in our home that fosters creativity, problem solving, and social responsibility. As I discussed child development with our pediatrician and thought what would be the most effective way to prepare my children for the future, our family decided to drastically limit screen time, using play and books as the foundations for our kids' education. Imagine how frustrated I was when my son started kindergarten and was handed a tablet. I was confused because clearly the people in charge knew how detrimental screen time can be to developing minds and bodies, right? And clearly our educators had read the articles that seemed to pop up daily discussing how kids are getting too much screen time, right? And clearly we have better ways to be spending that kind of money, right? I understand that the kids have these devices because there's a belief that they will prepare them for the future filled with technology. And it is true that they will be immersed in technology as adults, and undoubtedly, many will pursue careers in technology. <coughs> but handing five-year-olds a tablet is not how you prepare them for the future. If you want kids to be prepared, teach them to read books, not iPads. Teach them to work on projects with their peers, not isolated with headphones. Teach them math through physical manipulation, not Dreambox. As older kids, teach them, as older kids, teach them to code not to play video games. Teach them to build robots, not just use apps. I understand the value of computers, that, val that the value that computers have in opening up an otherwise unavailable world. And screens can be wonderful and enriching. But in a school district that lacks proper facilities, shortage of educators and counselors, and not enough basic supplies for our kids, why are we pushing these devices into our kids' hands and into our homes? You are the stewards of these funds. Please put these resources to better use to truly prepare our kids for the future. Thanks. Our next speaker is Rachel Fryman. Rachel Fryman. Good evening. Good evening. Um, thanks for having us. Um, I am a kindergarten teacher at Randallstown Elementary School, and my purpose of being here is to speak on behalf of the computers and how we use them in our classroom and how I see it as a vas valuable tool in education. Um, in our school, um, Technology at home is not always prevalent, so it's important to have them in our classrooms. Um, right now, I have a good amount of English language learners in our school, and this is a really valuable tool um, to promote English proficiency for students who only receive ESOL services maybe once or twice a week. And I do not speak Spanish, so having the computer is very valuable to me. Um, as far as um, other primary students, it's a good motivator, um, especially for fine motor skills, which is a um, what I focus on in my classroom. We do research projects, we have animal projects, and using tools such as Pebble Go and Brain Pop is wonderful because for my students who cannot necessarily read, um, it reads to them. And having that research tool is so important and to prepare them for college and career readiness, even at age of five. Um, it provides virtual manipulatives, math counters, um, Dreambox. A lot of my students can't use Dreambox at home because they don't have computers, they don't have tablets. Um, and uh, thank you for your investment in conscious discipline. I use that every day. And without technology, I don't know if my conscious discipline teaching would be as motivating as it is to my students now through videos. Um, and I just 
to close real quick before I hand it over. I just think it's a value, it's a tool, another tool that we use to enhance instruction. And I think it's really important to extend that classroom learning through the use of um, technology. And I think it's a, a true investment in our child's futures. Um, and I'm just gonna, I'm one of the special educators that works at Randallstown, and um, it really should be just used as a tool, and I don't think that we're saying the kids should be on it all day, every day, because obviously that's not appropriate, but we do want them on it, and it does provide opportunities for research and um, typing things out, and in the special ed perspective, um, there's three programs that provide for differentiation that I can just think of off the top of my head, like Dreambox and iReady and Pearson, and with teachers doing guided reading in one small center, then the kids can do other really great um, used pre programs on their own, like the Dreambox or then um, Pebble Go. Um, it's just, there's so many tools that you can use. So I just had a special education perspective. It's a really great um, resource for, I mean, differentiation and personalized learning, which is what the 21st century of education is really all about. Thank, Thank you. you. Our next speaker is Pete Holder. Thank you, Chairman Gillis, Vice Chairman Stewart, Ms. White, and members of the board and the BCPS community. Good evening to you. My name is Pete Holden, and I am the Library Media Specialist at Rogers Forge Elementary School. I'd like to thank the board for their continued support, students, teachers, and learning in Baltimore County. As a teacher at Rogers Forge Elementary, I feel compelled to speak tonight in support of a continued contract for student devices for all grade levels. Students and teachers at our school have now had one-to-one -one devices for four years. Taking them away from any grade levels at this point will be taking such a huge step backward for the school system. Our students have learned to be true 21st century learners in a blended learning environment. Doesn't the Lighthouse School's achievement data speak for itself? Results of the three-year STAT evaluation have been unequivocally positive across the board in both reading and math, grades one through five, earlier than expected. Lighthouse School students have outperformed students across the state in the country, and not just minimally. And as a library media specialist myself, I've watched students collaborate using Office 365, creating the same presentation at the same time on different computers to offer a persuasive argument as to who is the most important explorer to world history, or right now, fourth graders learning about Kid Started and Kid Run charities so that they can identify community problems and find their own unique way to change the world together. It certainly was a bold step to give students the opportunity to achieve these 21st century goals, but I've seen the amazing results of this decision. Students are able to work together to solve a real life problem in project work teams. That's an idea that mirrors the world of work. They see more of the world around them, and they're figuring out ways to change that world and make it better. I ask you to continue to let them have that opportunity to make that happen. Uh, with the continued funding of STAT initiative and devices for students on all students and staff in Baltimore County. The newly purchased learning management system, Schoology, is designed specifically to include some awesome key components that our teachers requested, components that only work with one-to-one -one student access. If devices were taken away, that would also completely take away both teacher and student use of this LMS as anything more th than a glorified grade book and curriculum housing station. I ask you to please consider all of these important factors, among others, as you make this important decision about our students' educational futures. And I thank you for your time tonight. Thank you. Our next speaker is Diana Bergman. Good evening. Let's refocus on how we're, fending, how we're spending our education funding. I think our priorities are not in line in the 24th largest school district in our nation. 
I'm not a product of Baltimore County. I'm a product of Miami-Dade County, the fourth largest school district in the United States. And I want to focus on how we use technology to protect our kids, protect them. We have advanced in technology where we could build buildings that could contain a crisis to make sure that a child receives the supports and services that that child needs by providing community school programs with supports of wraparound services. When we have children across our nation walking out using the First Amendment right, crying as loud as possible because they want to stay safe. I don't want to talk about $140 million for a computer technology program because that's not going to guarantee my child to return back home alive. I want to look at how we build our education system to make sure that our kids feel safe as they're getting an education. I want to make sure that Baltimore County, as it continues to grow, has the experts sitting on the table on how we do and plan renovations in high schools. The trailers at Patasco are not safe. All 13, 12, 18, they're not safe in any school. They're not going to protect our children from a bullet. I want buildings, when we have aging infrastructures, we have to relook at those blueprints. Make sure that our first responders and our law enforcement participate in the design of that building to keep our school and building safe. Our children, our teachers, our supporting staff, every single one of us, even you sitting up here. At any moment in time, you could be touring a school. The freedom that these little kids have on, 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 on the web, on the web, you think emotionally is keeping them safe if they have access on that browser to look at things they have no business looking at? I mean, there are ways that we could do things. We could set an example using these high schools to set a new standard for the state of Maryland. So we consider on every little penny you guys are using to invest in our children's education. Our next speaker is Gina Strauss. Good evening. Thank you for allowing me to be heard. My name is Gina Strauss. I've been in the field of education for over 25 years. I'm from a family of teachers, and my two daughters attend a Baltimore County Middle School one of whom will move to a Baltimore County High School next year. I'm here tonight to express my concern in the quick manner that this vote on devices is taking place. I understand the need for technology in the classroom and making it available to all students and teachers. However, we are now in a time of history where we need to be more mindful in how we are spending our money to support our students and, quite frankly, to keep them safe. I've been very happy with much of my daughter's experience in Baltimore County Schools. They have good teachers. They've had a good administrations. People are working hard for their benefit. My girls are good students who have given back to their school and county. My youngest daughter will be here at the next board meeting to be recognized for a national award she won. I am here speaking for them. I am here speaking for their school administrators who know the problems of the school yet don't have the resources to fix them because of open staff positions that are not filled or money that has been taken from facility improvement. I'm speaking for the parents of students who are homeless and come to school hungry. I'm speaking for the students who come to school addicted, start fights, who are depressed, who are bringing unsafe items to school, and who are not able to get the help because enough resource people are not there. I'm here speaking for the teachers who work tirelessly for their students and are forced to be responsible not only for teaching and testing, but also for the multitude of personal and academic issues brought to them by their students. The experienced teachers who are pulled from their teaching duties to cover the duties of another position that has not yet been filled or is desperately needing, leaving many students with the substitute teacher yet again. 
These things are happening not just at my daughter's middle school, they're happening all over our county. Technology is important, supporting technology is important, but so is student safety. Transparency and prudent action is called for. Fiscal responsibility and caution is in order. Assess all the issues, please. There are solutions available to meet everyone's needs, both students and teachers spoken here tonight. Please be mindful and do what is in the best interest of our children. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jim Melia. Malia, sorry about that. Good evening. I want to start out by respectfully disagreeing with uh, my colleague from Rogers Forge about statistical significance of lighthouse schools. And I was personally here listening to all the statistics and um, <laughs> from, our, from our county employee, and um, I don't think we found much difference. Um, but in, in the 1500s, Copernicus revealed a fact that made sense to him. The sun was the center of the universe. And this fact was met with great resistance. But to explain anything else required tricky physics. And it didn't make sense. Everything simplified when the Earth rotated around the sun. But the notion of change and being wrong and getting rid of the what's in it for me or change of direction can outweigh common sense. I live in a county where the daily repeats of front page news our former school employees who are making decisions based on what was in it for them. And from the outside, such an organization is explained by tricky physics until you get to the truth, and then the sun is back in the middle, and all the mysteries are explained. Our school, Lansdowne High School, is getting ready for a one-to-one -one laptop program, a program that is run over budget by approximately $164 million in four years. Last summer alone, 78% of student devices needed repair and required almost 60,000 parts. This far exceeded the contract expectations and put the contract over budget. And yet, we continue forward with these decisions. Last month, we had a teacher in school whose projector burned out, and we drug an overhead projector out of the closet to teach algebra for a month because we ran out of projector money. We've cut magnet monies. Printers have been removed from the school, and aid possession positions have been reduced, all in the name of finding money to pay for this one-to-one -one program. Um, it feels like we'll be left with a school full of students with their devices and money for no nothing else. In a bigger money picture of budgets and buildings, I learned today that Senator Kassmeyer now supports a renovation again because he's listening to the fire department, the Lansdowne Community Association, and others that support his position. He didn't listen to the PTA, the teachers that work in the building, the students that live in the building all year long, and this money is here uh, if it's used more wisely. I know politics and boards of ed are not for the faint of heart, but to me, it looks like there's a lot of tricky physics that are need, need to be explained to find out exactly what's going on. Thank you. Our next speaker is Brenda Pfeiffer. Good evening. Um, I am here this evening also to ask you not to approve the contract with Daily Computers that you're set to vote on soon. Um, the seven-year contract, as we've heard, is expected to cost $140 million, and I do have some serious concerns that I'd like to First are some general concerns about the STAT initiative. The rollout of STAT began a few years ago, and so far it has pro proven to be more hype than substance. The most recent data we've received from the Johns Hopkins group that's studying the STAT implementation seemed encouraging on the surface. However, a closer look and more critical look at the park score data reveals that there's nothing to indicate that lighthouse schools have, are any better off than non-lighthouse schools. And I happen to have some information here for the park scores for the 10 lighthouse elementary schools. Only four of the 10 of them are performing above state average right now. 
Um, in addition, the most recent report from Johns Hopkins notes that there are reports of frequent off-task behavior and inappropriate use of devices, which we've heard about tonight, technical issues we've heard about tonight, inadequate planning time for teachers and staff. And based on my own research and observations, I would concur. There's no evidence that a technology initiative like STAT will have any benefits for the students. And I have seen firsthand that technical issues and inappropriate use of devices is a significant problem that has not yet been brought under control. And in fact, I've been so disappointed and frustrated by what I've seen so far that I'm not so sure I will sign that contract next year for my child to bring home a device. It would seem that adding another $140 million on top of the money already spent to STAT before taking time to objectively address these issues is simply a waste of money. In addition, there have been a great deal of questions raised in recent months regarding procurement practices for contracts in BCPS. Many stakeholders have questions about the ethics of decisions made in recent years by BCPS when it comes to awarding contracts to ed tech companies. In general, many stakeholders believe that there's a lack of integrity that has been shown, and we are waiting for a thorough and completely independent audit or other evidence to restore our trust in BCPS procurement practices. While we wait for these answers, the wisest course of action would be to put decisions about additional ed tech contracts on hold so that no other contracts may come into question at a later date. Then stakeholders could be assured that BCPS is spending their money in the wisest and most responsible way possible. There is no need to approve this contract with daily computers at this time. There are options for next year, such as waiting for the full rollout of Staten High Schools or reducing the device to student ratio in elementary schools and moving those extra devices up. With STAT failing to bridge the academic improvement so, or to bring academic improvement so far and instead introducing problems that need to be addressed and with unanswered questions about BCPS contract procurement practices, the right thing to do for all BCPS stakeholders is to wait. Please vote to reject the contract with daily computers. Thank you. Our next speaker is Rachel Lynn. Good evening. Um, speaking on behalf of my wife and PB30, my name is Mark Chow and we live in PB30. Um, thank you for the opportunity tonight to speak uh, to every one of you. Um, as you can see uh, in the audience, we have quite a lot of representation from PB30. Um, would um, PB30 please stand up? Um, these are concerned parents. Uh, concern, concerning the, the school re, uh, re boundary study, uh, redistri redistricting. Um, so as uh, PB30 probably is one of the most opinion, uh, one of the a community that speaks um, very loudly uh, and has uh, very um, uh, much of an opinion on the current option C. Um, our community is very much appreciated the time and the effort that the um, Boundary study committee has put in. Uh, no doubt, this is a daunting task. Um, but you know, as as everyone um, here in PB30 would like to address um, three issues that we see in option three. First of all, uh, option three, uh, option C, um, as, the, as the way the map is uh, drawn, um, PB30 is in a tuck away um, a situation where it's boundary by Honeygold Boulevard. Um, two uh, parks, regional parks, one uh, Honeygo uh, Run and Gout Park, uh, as well as there's a small ravine um, uh, bordering the backside of our community as well. So this makes PB30 a satellite community. Um, the closest community uh, that's next to us is uh, PB157 and PB39 without crossing Honeygo Boulevard and without um, uh, crossing uh, or, or reaching over the, the parks, um, PB30 is literally a castaway community. Um, there's no, there's no uh, possible sidewalk that can co connect the community with the surrounding um, uh, uh, community, uh, which goes to the same school. Second issue is uh, that we, we, we feel that uh, with the current construction of uh, Strawbridge Common uh, development, which is currently on the way, uh, that is about 0.3 miles um, that the, the homeowner can actually see from their second floor window um, and, and see the school, uh, Chapel Hill. Um, 
the kids in the community probably will wonder why are we going to the new school while the kids across the street, which is Honeygold Village, they can just walk to school, but then yet they have to take a bus to go half a mile down the street uh, on Honeygold to go to the new school. So um, we, we feel that you know, with, with the Strawberry Common development being finished, that will create a uh, walkable path from our community to Chapel Hill, which will make us uh, more connected to uh, Honeygold Village, as well as the surrounding um, uh, neighborhood with the kids are going to the same uh, Chapel Hill school. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Elizabeth Hembling. glasses now it's really not good members of the board I'm here to update you on current legislation pending in Annapolis that could greatly impact Baltimore County I've handed out details of what I'm discussing so it's coming around from both sides the document includes committees can you hear me okay committees and members who are hearing these bills um, the House uh, bills are planned to be voted out of subcommittee tomorrow, so time is of the essence. Uh, most of you know me, I'm the chap one of the chapter leaders for Decoding Dyslexia Maryland. We recently held a Dyslexia Advocacy Day in Annapolis, and at the event, your own Megan Shea discussed everything that Baltimore County is doing to train teachers in structured literacy and how successful the initiative has been um, for the county. Uh, both Ms. Shea and Ms. Ryder, um, they probably, uh, hopefully they'll come again next year because now they're receiving calls throughout the state <laughs> from other Maryland systems asking them how they are implementing uh, the screening, the universal screening that they're doing, the letters training and the Orton-Gillingham training. Uh, while Baltimore County is now considered ahead of the curve, the rest of the state, including our area colleges, who are graduating new teachers are way behind, and that's why this legislation is crucial. We do need your support, and we, we really need your support, and we ask you to contact legislators, legislators on um, our behalf. The first bill is House Bill 910, Senate Bill 548. This is a universal screening bill. This is something that Baltimore County has already um, adopted and has successfully started uh, we need the rest of the state to kind of catch up to where you are right now so um, a kind word would be great house bill uh, 493 senate bill 638 um, this one requires teachers of reading to take a pre-certification exam on the foundations of reading as they do in states like Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Connecticut, and Wisconsin. Um, this would be required for teachers graduating who would be teachers of reading, not for current teachers. And this bill would help uh, grad, um, graduate teachers with full understanding of structured literacy so that Baltimore County would not have to spend so much time and money on retraining. Uh, the complement to this uh, pre-certification bill is House Bill 1657. This bill probably needs the most support. It does not have a Senate tandem, and it would require teacher educators to obtain professional development in uh, foundations of reading and, you know, how can university professors properly teach structured leader, uh, literacy if they're not prepared themselves. We've heard these complaints over and over from your leadership that they really want these teachers coming out of pre-service with these um, skills intact so these bills will help really solidify, um, you know, teachers coming to you already trained. We really appreciate all the investment that you all have made in the Orton-Gillingham and Structured Literacy Program, and we urge you to continue on this path. It's really worked. Thank you. Next on our agenda, uh, there was also a, an opportunity for citizens to sign up and to speak about the proposed name for the new Northeast Elementary School, uh, but there were no persons uh, who signed up for that. So next on our agenda, item F is the superintendent's report. Ms. White. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. In recent weeks, one issue has been at the forefront of everyone's mind. So I want to assure our community that our student safety is the number one priority in BCPS. So when our students walk out of the door every day and every morning, our first concern is that they return home safely at the end of the day. So school climate has been a focus area this year in order to create learning environments that meet students' needs and to teach students how to resolve conflicts and restore and repair relationships. And an equally important part of our focus on climate has been ensuring logical consequences for students who intend to cause harm to any of their peers or to staff. I would like to thank our staff members for working hard each and every day to get to know and support our students in order to keep them safe and secure. I would also like to thank our parents for partnering with us to keep our students safe. Thank you for talking to your kids, monitoring their social media behavior, and alerting us of problematic behaviors. I would also like to remind Mind all students that if you see something, please say something. Students play a powerful role in helping us hold everyone accountable for their words and their actions. At the beginning of every school year, students and parents sign off on our student handbook to demonstrate our partnership as a community committed to student safety. Last but definitely not least, I would like to thank Chief Sheridan and the Baltimore County um, Police Department for collaborating closely with our Department of School Safety and with our schools to maintain order in all of our schools. We are stronger when we work together as a team. Let's continue to work together on this essential goal to ensure a safe and orderly learning environment for all students in every school every day. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Next is an opportunity uh, for the chair to speak. The events of recent days uh, present an opportunity. Uh, the opportunity afforded this board and this school system is to focus on the tasks at hand and to deliver a 21st century education in a safe environment uh, to our more than 113,000 students. In order to do this, uh, we should all pull together to jointly steer the ship in the correct direction of education. All of us, from we board volunteers to school system professionals, uh, must not let recent events distract us from our core mission. Uh, there can be no doubt that uh, our core mission is the delivery of premier education to our students. Our students, our future, uh, count on us to remain focused on that mission. I urge all of us here tonight and throughout our county of over 800,000 citizens to join together to ensure uh, that we do not lose sight of our core mission, superior public education. Now it's time for Ms. Josie Schaefer, our student board member. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, first, I'd like to give an update about the search for the 2018-19 student member of the board. I'm blown away by the incredible applicants and I'm so excited to meet them. Uh, this week we will have an application screening and then later this month we will conduct interviews. Um, this time next month, April 6th, over 200 students from all over the county will have elected their new SMOB. This is the third year we will be holding an election for the student member, and I am so thrilled that students have the chance to vote for the person they think will serve them best. I cannot stress enough the importance of student opinions on the board. So I'd like to show you if the board members can join me. It's like a raise your hand kind of activity. So raise your hand if you're on the board. Please all raise your hand. <laughs> um, keep your hand raised if you participated in two or more clubs in high school. Ms. Hen, are you not on the board? <laughs> uh, now keep your hand raised if you took at least three AP courses, um, which is the average amount of advanced placement classes that BCPS students take a year. Um, a lot of kids take seven. The average is three. AP classes. <laughs> Advanced placement. Uh, keep them up if you have taken the new SAT. Keep them up if you took the park test. Keep them up if you took the map test. Keep your hand raised if you use computers as a resource in your classroom. So, hey guys. Uh, <laughs> um, so while the Board of Education votes on policies and contracts that uh, affect student life, the students are the ones that truly feel the effects and understand what this, um, this might look like in the school. So I'm so, so, so excited 
to meet all the new applicants, to have the chance to interview them, and for students to get to elect them. That's so cool. I'm really excited. And we'll keep you all updated. Um, so also, um, the second episode of my BCPS TV show, On the Move with Josie, is out now. We visited the uh, Newtown High School's Rising Women's Club, where they started their own business called Unity. I love seeing the girls' passion for their business, and it was very interesting to watch as they made plans to market and sell their product. You can watch the episode on BCPS TV's Vimeo, and be sure to look out for the third episode where I visited Towson High School's Knit for the Needy, um, where they knit and then they donate everything to a homeless shelter, and they're really cool and very inspiring. Um, I've had a great time visiting schools, and visiting the clubs has allowed me to see unique things each school brings to make BCPS a great school system. If you want your school's student lab club to be featured on a future episode, you can email me at jeschafer at bcps.org. I also went to Pikesville High School's Night of Innovation, which is my favorite event of the school year. Um, it's so much fun to see staff members attend, BCPS staff members attend, and as my fellow board members can attest who toured Pikesville with me, you cannot visit the school without going to my multimedia class and seeing my vector portrait. The Night of Innovation allows parents and future students to not only see how we use devices in a classroom, but they also get a glimpse of the different classes and clubs. Every student has one class they are passionate about, and Night of Innovation showcases cases that. At Pikesville, there are booths for every department. Um, the Project Lead the Way students had robots that were moving around the gym. Um, the multimedia students um, showed their escape games that they coded and animate. The English students were having a Socratic seminar right in the gym. And the French students were making crepes. The Night of Innovation is an event, uh, is a, the event for students to showcase what they're passionate about. And I love seeing the students in action. Um, lastly, I'd like to thank the Baltimore County Student Councils for meeting with the board this evening. I am so proud of the students who, um, for their thoughtful input on drills, mental health, and other safety measures. As students, we look to the adults in our county for guidance and support. But we can only do that if, student, uh, if adults are willing to have an open conversation with us. So I'd like to thank the board for listening and participating as well. Thank you, Ms. Schaefer. Next on our agenda, item I, is policies. And I call on the chair of our policy review committee, Mr. Birch. Thank you, Ed. Uh, members um, uh, and Mr. Chair, the Board of Education's Policy Review Committee asked the board accept this report of the committee's recommendations to amend the following board policies. 0300, Equal Employment Opportunity, 3123, Reporting, 6401, gifted and talented education. The proposed amended policies are presented to you on tonight's board agenda as Exhibit I. The committee considered public comments received at the board's February 9th meeting. Thank you. Do I have a motion to adopt the recommendations of the board's policy review committee? Mr. Chair, could we split them up? We can. I have some amendments for number four. Five and nine. We're on. We're just on policies 0300, 3123, and 6401. Okay. All right. Good. So there's a motion. Um, do we okay. need a second on that? No need for a second. So, Mrs. Causey. motion is um, I would like to move that we add to the title I would like to move that we add to the title of policy 6401 the word gifted education so that it would be renamed advanced academics and gifted education All right is there let's see is there a second I'll second all right, now, so there's first a motion. We'll, we'll handle 6401 first. There's a motion to accept the recommendation from the committee and now a motion to change the title of that uh, policy. Um, any discussion on that amendment, Ms. Causey? Thank you, Mr. Chair. We've heard repeatedly from our um, advocates on the special, um, excuse me, on the Gifted and Talented Citizens Advisory Council, um, who we heard tonight from um, Judy miller breeds and she's talking about amplifying our uh, gifted and talented opportunities that we do provide for our students. And what better way to do it than to have it, it, the word gifted remain in the policy 
Not only that, we have legal requirements around gifted education. So it is, again, important to have that word in the policies. It's readily available for parents, um, students, and community members to uh, identify that policy. Okay, further discussion? Mr. Birch? Thank you, Ed. Um, I think it speaks very well of the system that, in fact, it was this year um, that uh, additional staff were proposed for this most excellent gifted and talented education program. I would suggest, however, in the 21st century, we should not be placing any program on a pedestal. It should not overshadow any of the other, and you will note by looking at the policy, it reads instruction special programs, not overshadowing any other special programs that we have. <coughs> Our special programs also include our international baccalaureate courses. They also include our advanced placement courses, our dual enrollment courses, our greater subject level acceleration. These are all special opportunities offered to our students to pretend that somehow by including a program's title in a policy, uh, existing policy title or an amended policy title in this case, that somehow that significantly affects how the policy develops. I would suggest to you this, that very same wording had been in a prior version of this policy. Folks from the gifted and talented um, advisory um, uh, group, in fact, met with folks from um, BCPS and a draft was placed together with the input of both parties and their input has resulted in a policy that now matches how our programs proceed. And in fact, I was here when that original version that had advanced academics and gifted and talented as the same thing was proposed. And that was brought back by the committee and it was reworked with the specific input of folks from the gifted and talented advisory council and from the staff. We should not be about placing any single program on a pedestal. We should be proud of all of ours. The rubric, the umbrella, Heading, which is all this conversation is about, is what is a, a, a heading, and that heading is advanced academics. It does not denigrate, it does not lessen, it does not in any way compromise the commitment of our system to providing advanced academic opportunities for our students, whether they be, as I enumerated before, international baccalaureate class, classes, dual, enrich, dual enrollment courses, grade and subject level acceleration, these extended, accelerated, and or enriched instructional content strategies or products in elementary courses. We should be about hailing all of our excellent programs. And the fact that we have a single heading and we have all of them enumerated speaks well of our system. It does not detract from either our system or from the very fine programs which we have. If you want to go back in time to an earlier policy that was not, that was proposed but was not accepted, well then you can continue to look backwards. We're looking forward with all of our students and the special gifts, the special talents, and the special opportunities we want to provide to them. Mrs. Hen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I support Mrs. Causey's name change on the basis of clarity. Thank you. I support Mrs. Causey's name um, suggestion in the, um, on the basis that it adds clarity to our policy. We need to um, make our communications clearer to be able to reach parents, to be able to share information with them. Even um, through small steps, it goes a long way in communicating um, that information to parents. And by adding the um, label gifted to the heading, it may seem small and insignificant to this board, but I assure you it is not. If parents are looking for information on this policy, it grabs the attention by placing it in that header. And again, it's a small step, but a significant one in how we communicate to our parents. Other, Mrs. Miller. Thank you. I have attended a few of the um, GTCAC meetings where they have expressed concern over the deletion of that language, uh, of uh, the G, uh, GT language. So I would support it for that reason. Other comments, Mrs. M um, I'm sorry, Mrs. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, to Mr. Virch's point, yes, the GTCAC did have uh, numerous conversations and they did bring it back, but even after the uh, administration brought forward the policy 6401, 
without the word gifted in it, we have received multiple emails from, G from GTCAC still encouraging us to add it back and not to diminish any of the other wonderful programs that we do have and that we do offer um, because we do offer a great deal for our students for enrichment and expansion. Um, but again, this is uh, the only one of those that has a legal requirement for the board. So it's important for both of those reasons. Thank you. Mr. Virch. Thank you, Ed. I would just end with this, with this observation. While there are COMAR regulations, there are COMAR regulations for a host of what, for a host of the programs that we do. And we should incorporate them. But that does not mean that in any way we should diminish, diminish the, the opportunities presented by or the recognition that's provided to our students by the variety of special programs which we offer. Um, I end on this note. We are not done. There are significant accounting oper uh, accountability provisions in this policy. It speaks well to the Policy Review Committee because it was the members who specifically listened to our gifted and talented folks who asked for accountability to be included in this policy. By us going forward with one central heading for all of our programs, we do not delete from any of them. And I would suggest that, to, that if we believe our parents are not able to find this program, I think that's a bit of a patronizing attitude towards our parents who love their children and want only the best for them. I know I do, and I think the members of our board do as well. Thanks. Ms. White. Yes. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would just uh, say for the board's consideration that, first of all, we appreciate the collaboration with the GTCAC. We've had um, remarkable collaboration with the GTCAC in, order, in terms of policy revision and development. If you can recall, we did have substantial um, conversation and meetings and uh, collaborative effort. And so just uh, for the board's consideration, there is language here that speaks to all of the differentiated programs. There is also language here in terms of specifically identifying um, students um, who are, have been identified as gifted and gifted and talented in the policy language in C and D for the board's consideration. So, Ms. Causey, the suggested uh, title is? Advanced Academics and Gifted Education. Advanced Academics and Gifted Education. So that's the motion uh, that is on the table now to change the title to 6401. All in favor of it, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, the motion carries. So now we have a motion on uh, 0, 0300, 3123, and 6401 as amended. There's been a motion for that. Any further discussion? All in favor, please raise your hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, the motion carries. Mr. Birch. Thank you, Ed. <laughs> Um, Mr. Chair and members of our, the, of our board, uh, at the board's January 9, 2018 meeting, a motion was made to return the following policies to the Policy Review Committee to consider board member comments. The Policy Review Committee made no further changes to the following policies and asked that the board accept this report of the committee's recommendations to amend the following board policies. 8230, orientation of new board members. 8250, Board member responsibilities. 8270, board committees. 8280, memberships. 8320, final action by the board. Thank you. Do I have a motion to adopt the recommendations of the board's policy review committee uh, regarding 8230, 8250, 8270, 8280, and 8320? Mr. Chairman, could we pull out uh, 8280? 8280, we will. So, do I have a motion to accept the recommendation of the Policy Review Committee about 8230, 8250, 8270, and 8320? All right, no second is needed. Any discussion? Mrs. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just uh, want to say that I appreciate the um, last Policy Review Committee meeting that we had um, run by our Vice Chair, Mr. Chuck McDaniels. We did have the opportunity to review um, internal board policies. And while I do believe that there are areas where they could be strengthened, um, 
to have better accountability, better uh, workings within the board. I do feel that it's, I will be voting for them because I do feel that they are a step forward, um, but I do feel there's more work that can be done in the future. Thank you. Good. Any other comments? All right, all in favor of uh, the motion regarding 8230, 8250, 8270, 8320, please raise your hands. One, two, three, four, five. The motion carries. Now, 8280, um, is there a motion to accept uh, the recommendation of the Policy Review Committee? So moved. All right, and no need for a second. Ms. Miller. Thank you. Um, I was concerned about the language regarding associations, and I'm trying to pull it up right now. Um, I guess it's in 1B. The board believes that professional development through membership in national, state, and regional associations enables board members to serve effectively and efficiently. Um, so I wasn't sure when it talked about, I mean, I, I assume this is only regarding board members and not the Board of Education, meaning all um, employees of the system. Is that correct? I can always defer to our council. Right. Correct. Okay, because I was concerned that mm -hmm. it didn't set um, clear parameters <laughs> on associations uh, given given recent events that we've had. But definitely five, just, I just reread B. I mean, B says enables board members to serve effectively and efficiently. Right. Effectively and efficiently, so okay. it just applies to board members. Further questions or comments? Thank you. Ed, I would just note, at the top it clearly reads internal board policies. Very good. Very good. All in favor of 80, uh, the, uh, the recommendation of the Policy Review Committee regarding 8280, please raise your hand. The motion carries. Mr. Virch. Thank you, Ed. Um, at its February 12th meeting, the Policy Review Committee recommended further revision of the following policies. 8130, policy formulation. 8222, superintendent, executive officer, secretary, and treasurer. Um, I had a very bad virus and did not attend. Um, as chair, I have to do what I think is appropriate as chair. Um, I move to recommit these policies. Um, that's my motion because of, for reasons I'm happy to share with the board, but a second would be needed for me to then elaborate as to why I move to recommit. Second. second. All right, discussion. Mr. Virch. Um, well, first, let's take 8222. Um, our board is a board that provides governance to a system that promotes literacy and the efficient delivery of services, educational services, to our students. As one looks at the draft of this particular policy which came out of the Policy Review Committee, and I'm not saying it would have been any different had I been present, and I don't mean to suggest that in the least, but in terms of how well it is currently drafted, um, without, without making a, an argument as to the substantive nature of any changes, the fact is the way they're written, um, they don't even follow an outline uh, process that is usually recognized in the drafting of our policies. And in particular regard with 8220, one finds, um, uh, when one reviews, let me get this paper clip out of here, here we are. Take a look at two, under section two, two that's Roman numeral two, duties. Superintendent as executive officer. It's just kind of a hanging title. And then below it is some kind of clause. As executive officer, the superintendent shall. That isn't how that should like work. We can correct that by recommitting it without altering any substantive change that the Policy Review Committee sought. Directing your attention over to B, Superintendent to Secretary. Notice it doesn't even follow the same form as what's under A. Now this isn't the end of the world. It is readily correctable. And um, that's why I have made the motion to recommit with regard to policy 8220. 8222. 8222, thank you. Now, with regard to the other policy, um, I had the following thoughts. That's 8130. Correct, 8130. Um, when one reviews the policy and compares it to what currently exists, 
currently, the Policy Review Committee brings out a policy, whether developed by the committee or whether it be uh, a review from, say, our uh, five-year annual review. It comes, and there's about a month's worth of notice for our stakeholders, those folks who are stakeholders inside groups which meet monthly. They now have about a month to have their own meeting to look at the policy and then, you know, decide among themselves, are they going to take a position? If they're going to take a position, what is the position going to be? And then are they going to articulate the position to the board? Whether or not that is the most efficient way to proceed, that is one level of questioning. But it is still a month's worth of time for our stakeholders to be able to review anything that comes from the policy review committee. With this proposal, it may be as little as less than a week for what comes from the Policy Review Committee to then be on board docs for a board agenda and our stakeholder groups who may have their monthly meeting where they're able to have scheduled their time to be able to meet and review proposed policies affecting our students, they don't have that opportunity to then kind of gather. So then someone comes, are they able to represent that they speak for an entire stakeholder group? Are they able to say, well, we just kind of got this, but here's just some kind of things we're thinking about? There are other ways to communicate how one feels, but it takes what would have been a transparent month to look at and review and study and truncates that time for response to less than seven days. That's the first piece I wanted to share and why I, rec I suggest that this be recommitted to the committee. The last part of this is the following, and it relates to efficiency. Under that scenario, those comments that would have been made within less than seven days, it's then, those comments then come back to the PRC to then take and review to determine whether to incorporate them into the policy. And then it comes back for second reader. And now note, folks, they now are looking at a second version of something. Well, if they've had a chance and had the time to then meet with their stakeholder group, why not allow them that, why not afford them that opportunity up front? Lastly, I would suggest this to you as committee, as those members who are, are the policy review committee or are, are our board members. Because what many folks don't know is that board members sit on committees beyond the policy review committee. There's a curriculum committee. There's our audit committee. There's our con buildings and contracts committee. Where I'm going with this is the board actually needs to have an extended conversation about what should be the committee structure and the committee role in board operations. I note that it has not been the subject of a uh, summer retreat where board members can, I don't want to say let their air down, but they can sit and talk about what would make a committee system a viable means to gather information boil it down, discern policy imperatives, and then craft that into viable policy. While I know it's an election year, there is an opportunity for a retreat this summer to do exactly that and put in place, based on the vast experience of the members on the board, a workable policy for committees. Not just on the policy committee, but for all of our committees. I note when I sat on the end here, in case of a fire drill, I would have been the first out, but when I sat on the end, I remember uh, the chair of the curriculum committee discussing the recommendations of the curriculum committee. And I remember thinking to myself, okay, so there was a motion, it was seconded, there was discussion, and then there was a vote by the curriculum committee. Well, in fact, there had never been a motion, there had never been a second, and there had never been a vote. It was just called a recommendation and presented to the board. That suggests depending on how you look at the glass, uh, half full or half empty, either a broken system or, efficient, or a system that is far less than efficient for policy making for the 24th largest school system in the country. Let's not rush, truncate the amount of time that people have to comment on policies and then compound it by mandating that they return to us and give us even more feedback. And that is why I have made the motion to recommit. I'm just a single member of the board but having had the advantage of having been both a member of the Policy Review Committee and shook, and shook my head at some of, the, some of the ways that it operated, one of which was you never found out what the policy was if you're a member of the public until 
it actually came out of the committee. Well, we changed that as a committee starting very, very early last year when uh, the leadership changed on the committee. Now folks who sit in the audience can actually have a copy of what the people up here are talking about. But there is more to do, and the more to do is to have an efficient committee system, not cumbersome it and cut off opportunities for transparency and greater citizen participation. And that's why I moved to commit, recommit. So there's a motion to recommit 8130 and 8222. Further discussion? Mrs. Miller. I appreciate Mr. Virch's comments. I think that we do need to have those discussions um, as far as the role of our committees and um, increase the transparency. And I, I really like the changes that are being suggested. I don't remember which policy now, but as far as the um, readers and the, the time for public comment, um, uh, the uh, ideas for further transparency. So I would support that motion. Further discussion? <coughs> All right, the motion is to recommit 8130 and 8222 to the Policy Review Committee for further debate. All in favor, please raise your hands. The motion carries. I think that's the end of Policy Review and Item I. Item J is proposed boundary for the new Northeast Elementary School, and I invite Ms. Uh, you're already there. <laughs> Beat me to it. Mr. Roberts. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Gillis, Vice Chair Stewart, Superintendent White, and members of the board. This evening I bring forward for your approval the committee recommendation, option C, for the new Northeast Elementary School boundary change. As a part of the $1.3 billion capital plan, Schools for Our Future, BCPS has approved four school construction projects in the Northeast area. These projects are designed to improve facilities and increase student capacity to help relieve overcrowding in the area. In order to make the best and most efficient use of this added student capacity and in accordance with Board of Education policy in Rule 1280, the superintendent approved initiation of a boundary change process for the new Northeast Elementary School at Joppa Road in March of 2017. The boundary process for the Northeast Elementary School at Joppa Road began in September 2017 and will be voted on this evening by the Board of Education. The Boundary Study Committee for the Northeast Elementary School at Joppa Road met six times over the past five months in rev to review various boundary change options. Though the, through the boundary study, BCPS supported a process that fully engaged the community and shared information about the process as it unfolded openly with all stakeholders. So prior to taking any questions, I'd like to introduce again, Mrs. Charlene Benke, who's joining us this evening, the principal of the new Northeast Elementary School at Joppa Road, and thank her for her leadership throughout the year in getting the school ready to open in August 2018. So with that. All right, do I have a motion to accept <coughs> option C? Moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay, now that we have a motion and a second discussion, Mrs. Hen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that we amend option C with the following two changes. Um, to assign planning block 30 to Chapel Hill, which is its current assignment, and to assign planning block 28 to the new Northeast Elementary School. Is there a second to that motion to amend? Second. Okay, discussion on the motion to amend. Mrs. Hen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. These recommendations are based on the basis of new information that the Boundary Study Committee did not have during their process. I do want to mention that I appreciate the hard work of the Boundary Study um, Committee and their members and the dedication that they showed and the hours they spent in formulating this recommendation. Um, the new information um, that we should consider as a board is that Planning Block 28 um, will be developed. Currently, that is farmland. Um, occupied by more goats than students at this point. I think there are five students in the plan um, that will be developed to accommodate 50 homes. Um, to assign that planning block to Chapel Hill um, is unwise as the school cannot support that level of growth. The developer has asked that we consider assigning it to the school with additional capacity to support it. Secondly, um, planning block 30 will have easy, safe, walkable access to Chapel Hill Elementary with the addition of sidewalks the entire distance to Chapel Hill um, with the addition of the Strawbridge Commons development. Um, if we make this change, only 18 students will be added to Chapel Hill. The remainder of students in that community are already eligible 
to stay. These recommendations are consistent with the system's goals of increasing the number of student walkers, eliminating satellite communities, and using natural boundaries, in this case Honeygo Boulevard, um, to define school boundary areas. I'm confident that these amendments will best serve the students in both planning blocks and ask for your support. Further discussion? Mr. Virch. Um, Julie, if I may, I do have two questions for you. Do you know what, if any, is the current zoning for the undeveloped area that you suggest a developer will develop in Planning Block 28? I do. The, um, the current zoning would not allow that. However, um, I have information that suggests that that zoning will be changed to support the development of 50 homes. Uh, Ed, rather than, I only said two questions, so rather than continue to ask questions, the fact is that we are not in the current four-year zoning cycle process for Baltimore County. It's an election year. It will happen in two more years. So that zoning then is done by a body in Baltimore County. That is the Baltimore County Council. Because of what is known as council manic or council person courtesy, council folks extend the courtesy to whoever is the council person in a particular district. In the case of any currently zoned property, a developer suggesting as to something being developed, when in fact the current zoning doesn't allow it, must then be suggesting over the horizon that there will be a zoning change. I see, you, I see my friend and my neighbor, uh, Julie Henn, nodding as though that will occur because of a zoning change. Now the zoning change isn't happening today. It would have to happen in two years. What I think is noteworthy is the two things. Uh, first, the comments of folks who attended our public hearing. You may recall them. One of them had a name that our board chair asked, how does one pronounce it? Doran Ager commented specifically about the process, the process for the boundary study, and how it was transparent, and how it was open. Secondly, Jessica Smith similarly commented on the transparency of this process and how important it was. Those of you who may remember my advocacy in behalf of the Victory Villa uh, boundary study and ultimately what that drawing would be, I made the following comments. I said that whatever the policy and the rule was that existed when that boundary study committee of volunteers dedicated all that time to looking at this matter and absorbing this vast amount of information, when we have our public hearing, it should be the same policy and the same rule without any change. And I said when this board was taking a look at the Victory Villa boundary study recommendation, we should likewise use the same policy and the same rule. And in fact, when this board made its decision, a majority, and I, and I say the folks in that area benefited from the support of members of this board, I mean it sincerely, the same information was likewise used. There was no massaging of information. There was no guessing about over the horizon after an election in a new four-year rezoning cycle two years from now what zoning might or might not be. It was all the facts that was done within the study. I share that with you because the way growth is projected for our boundary study citizen volunteers who give up so much of their time it is not based on zoning, it is based on approved building permits. And those building permits only get issued pursuant to a development plan that is then generated pursuant to a zoning. So when growth was contemplated for particular schools, what folks looked at were the available building permits. And that's how it was determined where are students, where are they projected to be. In my neighbor and friend's analysis, she says that what's at issue here tonight is merely 18 additional students for Chapel Hill Elementary School who would come if we were to agree to a swap of Planning Block 30, which would go to Chapel Hill, for Planning Block 28 going over to the new Northeast Elementary School. What you have not been told is that the actual number of students is not 18. The total number is 65. Why is 65 important? Because, as you correctly said, there are some students who will remain at our Chapel Hill. 
those that will remain are special exception transfers who will remain. But there are more students because of the adjacent development called Strawbridge. And that is what's next door, but won't be connected by road to the existing community of Parkside, many of whom have expressed tremendous advocacy to remain at our Chapel Hill. But what this means is that if we flip out these two, swap out these two planning blocks, it now means that the students who would come from planning block 30 would put our Chapel Hill Elementary School above its existing state rated capacity. Yeah, the purpose of the boundary study is to get us below that state rated capacity so that we can address what you, I, and our joint neighbors agree is a concern in the Northeast and what drove the building of the new Northeast Elementary School. And while that won't solve because another Northeast Elementary School will have to be built, any ES2 south of the mall, sometimes referred to as the Ridge, the school on Ridge Road, that offers no opportunities to address any subsequent overcrowding if we were to swap out these two planning blocks for our students and their families at Chapel Hill Elementary School. That's the difference. <coughs> that new school won't offer any relief to the folks up here because of how spread out the students and their families are. Secondly, when I spoke last about the walkability of the planning block 30, I specifically mentioned that I had walked it. It, is a, it has a lovely new development in the planning block. Many of those homeowners are here tonight. Mm -hmm. But the fact is, when you think about it, every school, not that you would do it, but every school is walkable. It may take a long time, it may not be safe, but every school is walkable. What I pointed out was how close the advocates came to the line. It's walkable, but none of the students from that new development in Planning Block 30, the one that currently exists, none of them walk to the school. They ride the bus. They ride the bus not because there isn't a sidewalk. They ride the bus because of our safety requirements for transporting our students. And how do they get there? Well, this is the planning block with its new development. They get on a bus and they drive out of the development. And they drive along the boundary <coughs> with the boundary of the next planning block that's going to Northeast Elementary School. There is no satellite. If we compare it with a different planning block, a planning block that was inside of a neighborhood, and inside that neighborhood was an elementary school, and that elementary school was called Orms. The children in a planning block who rode a bus to Orms inside that neighborhood, they were riding inside their own neighborhood. They weren't getting on a bus and going outside of their neighborhood to then go to a school, which is what currently exists with Chapel Hill Elementary School. Secondly, the walking, these students don't walk. Families who may, God bless them, walking is a healthy thing. My doctor reminds me that I should do more of it. But who would walk during the school season when the sun goes down earlier each day and after, after school event it is dark to have to cross East Joppa Road, to then have to cross Callanton Avenue, to then come to your neighborhood? I suggest if that's the basis for how we draw our lines and where the 6,000 children go to school and their families look for them to go, then the idea of families walking to a school, however admirable, could then be used for every other school within the boundary study. This planning block 30 is not a satellite. There actually is a satellite in this planning study area. My recollection is it will now go to a school that it abuts a boundary for, which is, I think, Kearney Elementary School. And it may be, I want to say, Oakley, where this satellite, which is like a million, quite a distance away, you wouldn't think of walking it. They, they now go to like Oakley by bus. 
So the idea that walkability factors into this, that is walking close to the advocate's line because the students, whether they go to Chapel Hill or whether they go to the new Northeast Elementary School, would continue to ride a bus. The folks that live in Planning Block 30, I, I can remember meeting them at one of the earliest meetings of the study uh, committee. And we just, I just happened to sit down, we just started talking. I admire their advocacy and the love for their children. But we have 6,000 children whose families love them just as much and everyone for the efficient operation of our schools. And I would point out the safe operation of our schools. We all have to work together to figure out where these seats ought to go and where our students can best go. As, as the new principal of the Northeast Elementary School said to me the first time I talked to her about the boundary study, she said this, we are fortunate because all of the schools we have in Perry Hall are great schools. I don't believe we should swap out, swap out these two schools. I don't believe we should set a developer up to take something off of the public services checklist. Do we have sufficient water capacity? Do we have sufficient sewer capacity? Do we have sufficient road capacity? Do we have sufficient school capacity? Because the school would be different than going to Chapel Hill Elementary School where when it's overcrowded with students from Planning Block 30, there will be no additional relief in the future except the relief that can be offered by building an addition to the school, a costly addition when we tonight can solve for that, direct those funds to other things, and we solve by honoring the efforts made by all those committee members who spent low those many nights, all those many hours, the beauty of the transparency of this process, and it is not perfect, the beauty of the transparency of this process is one can go and watch the video of all the proposals that were made and how they were all articulated and how they were all studied. Remember the comments that I shared with you, Doran Ager and Jessica Smith, transparency. Note tonight, information is changing, information that was not made available to those <coughs> committee members. It suddenly appears we should not change a rule when this board does its business. We should not change a policy when it does its business with regard to boundary studies. And I would point out we should not change facts that were available to committee members, citizen volunteers who gave their many hours of time. I will be opposed to my colleague and neighbor's policy or motion. Mrs. Causey and then Mrs. Hen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would just like to say that we do understand on the board that the committees do work very diligently and many of us have attended those meetings or watched them on live stream and we do really appreciate them, the work of the volunteers, the parents and also the educators that are involved and certainly our staff who attend so many meetings. Um, but in terms of the process and respecting the process, part of the process is the public hearing that comes after the committee makes its recommendation. Part of the process is for the board members to understand the committee's work, but also the public hearing and also other due diligence that we do in terms of trying to come to a good decision. It's not the fault of uh, the committee or anyone else if there's information that's made available at a later time. And as to the issue of planning for the future, I think that if there are possible um, developments that are happening that we need to take that into account to plan better for the school system rather than to let things happen down the road when there is not an opportunity to do redistricting for maybe many years to come. So with that general input, I would be um, supporting additional conversation and supporting my uh, colleague. Mrs. Hen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so this decision is about what's doing best for the students. I'm not a zoning expert, nor do I claim to be. The fact is this, 55 homes will be developed on the property known as Planning Block 28. Chapel Hill cannot accommodate that type of growth. 18 students will be added to Chapel Hill um, from Planning Block 30, should we reassign that Planning Block to Chapel Hill. The rest are staying regardless of what decision we make. 
18 students will be added versus however many come from a 55 home development. The last thing personally I would advocate for is to overcrowd Chapel Hill. It's a school near and dear to my heart. My daughter graduated from there. I know this neighborhood like the back of my hand. I drive it every day. This is a walking community. Families attending Chapel Hill walk together to these events. Whether there are sidewalks or not, this is how families get to know one another. Um, they build community together. It contributes to that school's culture. So for these reasons, I again ask you to please support keeping Planning Block 30 at Chapel Hill and reassigning Planning Block 28 to the new Northeast Elementary. Further comment, discussion on the motion to amend. Mr. Gillis, Mr. thank Mr. you so much. I note the letter that was not made available before the boundary study process began. I note the letter that was not made a part of the boundary study, study process where folks met over at our local school. I note the letter that was not available for folks to see before the public hearing. And now I read the letter that I note. It is from the council person. He writes, should the Gerst farm, which is the 50 acres that my friend and neighbor Julie Hen, who passes by here every day, is referring to planning block 28, should the Gerst farm remain in the Chapel Hill Elementary School District, it will make it more difficult to develop this parcel. That is not me. That is the council person who would have to make a zoning decision. And if that's the case, then to say it will be developed and that there will be 50 houses, I think that is a look over horizon after an election and after a four-year zoning cycle process, which is two years away. I am. Um I see the letter you're reading dated March 5, and the way I read that sentence you just read is that if the Gerst Farm stays in the Chapel Hill development, it will be in an overcrowded school district and will not be able to be developed. It, well, then it may not even get its approval to be developed, is what you're really so, saying. So Thank that's you. why it needs to move to the other district. I think, I, I think that's what the letter says. Well, the, the letter's available for anyone here tonight to look at. It is unfortunate that we didn't have the transparency of the process. But I've spoken enough. Agreed. All right, further discussion? All right, the motion is to amend uh, the original motion, option C, to <coughs> assign planning block, block 30 to Chapel Hill and planning block 28 to the new Northeast Elementary School. All in favor of that motion, please raise your hands. One, two, three, four, five. The motion fails. All right, so the original motion is uh, to um, approve um, option C. That motion is on the table. Any further discussion on it? All in favor of option C, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The motion carries. I do note that um, you were not allowed to vote, so uh, the student member cannot vote on this item. All right, the motion to approve option C uh, carries. Can Next. I ask for division, please? All right, all in favor of um, item uh, of option C, raise your hands again and uh, no, you take a roll call, that's easier instead of me reading them. No. Yes. No. Ken? No. Mr. McDaniel? Yes. Ms. Miller? No. Mr. Stewart? Yes. Aye. Mr. Young? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, next on our agenda is, per thank you, uh, Mr. Roberts. Next on our agenda is personnel matters. I invite Dr. Mayo to come forward. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Vice Chairman Stewart, Superintendent White, members of the board. White board consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, leaves of absence, and certificated appointments. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters presented in exhibits K1 through K4? So moved. Is there a second? second? Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 The motion, uh, raise your hands, please. Uh, all in favor, one, two, three, four, five, six, then the motion carries, thank you. Thank you. Um, now, Administrative appointments. 
Mrs. White. Okay. Thank you, Chairman Gillis. Members of the board, I would like to bring forward for your approval the following administrative appointments. Principal, Lock Raven High School. Specialist, MSAP Magnet Programs, Department of Innovative Learning. And Title I Specialist, Office of Title I. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments presented in Exhibit L? Is there a second? second? Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. The motion carries. Ms. White. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to present the following individuals for their appointments, and I would ask that they stand when their names are called and also stand with any family members or friends that you might have here with you so that we can celebrate you. First, we have Allison Goldblum, who will be the new Title I specialist in the Office of Title I. Allison, who do you have here with you tonight? Congratulations. Welcome. Very good. I'd also like to introduce Janine Holmes, who will be the new principal of Lock Raven High School. Janine, I, I take it you have your, your beautiful daughters with you? My beautiful daughters with you. And my principal, who was my principal for most of my career in Baltimore County, and has supported me. Very good. Good to see you, Maria. Congratulations. Congratulations, Janine. <laughs> I'd also like to congratulate Kathleen O'Neill, who will be the new specialist, MSAP Magnet Programs in the Department of Innovative Learning. <laughs> Kathleen, who do you have here with you tonight? Wow. Very good. Congratulations. Here. I'm sure they love coming up here for the snow. That was perfect timing. <laughs> <coughs> All right, next on our agenda, we invite Mr. Nussbaum to come forward uh, to discuss action taken in closed session. Good evening. Earlier this evening, the board considered two appeals magic regarding. Again. What's that? You're doing your magic again. I know, it happens every time. Uh, I'm just going to breeze Keep right going. over. Uh, the board heard, uh, considered two appeals regarding confidential employee matters in your quasi-judicial capacity. One was an oral argument where the board heard from the parties. One was considered on the record as there was no request for oral argument made. At this time, it would be appropriate to confirm those actions taken in closed session in the matters which were uh, 17 dash, uh, hearing examiner number 1734 was the oral argument, 18-32 uh, was the summary affirmance. Do I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session? Second. Mr. Gillis, I have to recuse myself for the reasons we discussed. Very good. I'll also be uh, abstaining. Okay. Now, is there a second? Okay. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, and there are two abstentions. Are there any no's? The motion carries. Thank, Thank you. And the orders are on the table for signature. Thank you. Next, we have um, item N, uh, contract awards, and I call on our Contract Committee Chair, Mr. Stewart. So members, of the members of the board, uh, the board's at Building and Contracts Committee met earlier this evening. The committee voted to recommend that this board um, approve items two through five on our agenda this evening. And the committee further recommends that the vote on contract item number one be deferred until March 20th but that the staff now have opportunity to present information about that contract. How about if we invite Mr. Saris and whoever else is ready to come forward? Um, uh, do I need a second on that? We're going to vote on two through five first. Um, is, do, I don't need a second on that, right? All right, so any discussion on uh, accepting contracts uh, two through five as recommended by um, the contract committee. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Aye. All right, that motion carries. Now, uh, all in favor of the motion to uh, recommend receiving the report tonight regarding um, contract N1, but to defer board action until uh, March 20, um, uh, is there discussion on that? Yes. Mr. Virch. Thank you, Mr. Gillis. I noted the comments of our 
of our TAPCO president, Abby Baden. Um, I won't note her exact quotes um, because while I wrote them down, they aren't handy. But I note that the effect of a delay and the possibility then of a violation of a master labor agreement, which can trigger a grievance. I am not a labor attorney. I do not hold myself out to be an expert in labor law. But among remedies or um, consideration that is asked for in a grievance to the extent that our teachers may have to, if this board decides to give a, uh, to, to award a contract for devices, I observe then when would teachers, if there was such a contract award made, when would they have the time to familiarize themselves to incorporate all the many things they may already have in a device into this device to adapt it, to then do all the administrative things that they have to do and gain familiarity with it, when would they do that? Perhaps during the summer when they are not receiving a check for their services. Then the grievance would be for these, and our superintendent would know best. I know that the total milieu of instructional personnel exceeds 9,000, but the number of teachers, I, I, I suspect we have less than 9,000. We have about 9,000 teachers. We there you have go. almost 20,000, well, 21,000 9, teachers. Employees. If at 100 <laughs> bucks a pop as part of a, a, a grievance a request to compensate teachers for the time that they will, because they are so duty-oriented, duty that they would invest of their own time, 9,000 times 100 bucks gets us to $900,000, which now means $900,000 that could be used to hire additional counselors, $900,000 that could be used to hire additional pu per pupil workers, or for all the many other purposes that we could, we could take. With that in mind, the action that the board takes by delay then may run the risk of that or a greater cost. I'm just a layperson commenting on what I have observed tonight, what I have heard tonight. And I ask folks before they cast a vote to build additional time into uh, decision making to note that there may be a cost at the other end should a grievance arise as a result of a master labor agreement. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, any other comment? Mrs. Causey and then Mrs. Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, my colleague, Mr. Birch, brings up a good point about grievances. And I would remind this board and the community that in 2013, there was a grievance filed on behalf of the teachers, 8,700 at the time by TABCO. And the reason for that grievance was a, uh, a implementation that caused great disruption to the teachers. And it was the uh, rollout of the English language curriculum. And, uh, and so there are very grave possible negative consequences to not getting the program right. So I would ask everyone to consider delaying by two weeks uh, the program that right now we currently have very little information about. I sent in four pages of questions and I appreciate that we got a few answers um, on Friday and then we have just been given um, another sheet of paper that we have not had the opportunity to read and we haven't even heard the presentation. So I think having a two-week delay um, is quite reasonable, especially given a lot of the other input that we heard tonight from our stakeholders on advisory councils and also parents um, and teachers that it is important to get these programs right. This is a very large number of uh, teachers that are impacted if we don't make sure they have the right product with the right service, with the right implementation. So yes, a grievance is, a, is something that we wanna avoid, but the fact is is that it could be a grievance about the implementation or the service ongoing if we don't make sure that we have what they need ahead of time. So I would encourage us to take those two weeks and postpone the vote and make sure that we get it right. Mrs. Miller and then Mr. Young. Thank you. Um, our, our attorney across the dais uh, is jumping to uh, conclusions a bit. 
uh, with regard to violations of the master agreement. That would only occur if we actually moved forward um, with the rollout as it's currently proposed. But we do have the option of making some changes or delaying by two weeks to make up for the time difference. Um, the idea that there would be a, a grievance filed over that is pro my guess is going to be that that would be unlikely. And even if it were, the $900,000 represents less than one half of 1% the uh, cost of this $140 million contract. Mr. Young. Two simple questions um, for Dr. McComas or Mr. Smith. <clears throat> From the time that the contract is approved, how long would it take the um, selected vendor to deliver the devices to us? And the assumption is that they are already prepared with um, 9,000 devices in hand for our teachers. Or is that an incorrect assumption? It's not an incorrect assumption, but I think we need to let uh, Mr. Brown probably address that question specifically because he's dealing with the technical aspects of that. Good evening. Oh. The, oh. <laughs> uh, let, me, let me make sure I understand the question. Repeat that again. So from the moment the contract is signed, how long would it take the selected vendor to start the distribution process of the okay um, in device. the RFP that we distributed we had put in language for the vendor to let them know about the teacher units that needed to be in and right now if we pass it tonight then we are uh, the vendor and DOIT is committed by the first week of April to have those units here if we delay it then we will be uh, looking at probably the middle of May to get those units in. So it's about a three-week window time. So the contractual language around that is that the, the instructional resources should be in the hands of teachers in the, by the fourth quarter, by the which, fourth is quarter. The, which that time frame matches the, yes. um, the, the fourth quarter, just to make sure that you have that information. <laughs> If we delay it tonight, you're saying it will push it to, instead of the beginning of April, if it's approved tonight, to the middle of May? Yes. Because you got, you got, it's almost like a three, three to four week difference because you're delaying it two weeks. So that means we're going out two more weeks. So we won't get the contract until the, actually the first week of May, okay? So then that puts us out close to the first week of, of May, or yes, May. Even when we approve it tonight, the execution of the contract doesn't happen tonight. Right. So it's, we, have to, we have to get the contract executed to get the ball in play. So it's not like it happens tonight and then all of a sudden tomorrow everything goes to work. It has, we have to kind of get the execution of the contract and then that process starts. But that's always the case. That's always the case. So we're okay. talking about a two-week delay. But a two-week delay is turning into a almost a one-month addition. Because you're saying if we approve it tonight, it's the beginning of April. But if we don't approve it tonight, it becomes the middle of May. No, the f first part of May. So the first week to the second week of May is what we would be looking at if we don't if we wait two more weeks. Okay. All right. So the I would have taken the extra month because of a two week delay. It's not. You're saying beginning of April versus beginning of May. We're yes. It's it's, it's a month. Well, it, it <coughs> the contract itself is going to take us at least some time to get solid. Regardless, okay? either Regardless, way. Either way. So what we wrote in the contract if for the, not the contract, the RFP was to make sure that we had devices ready to go the first week of April. Okay, so that was in the RFP process. For me now to, to delay it, it's still going to take us at least because we're talking two weeks delay, right? Uh -huh. So now we got at least a week to get the contract. So that's almost three weeks, or would be three weeks. So there's your month. So the following week would be when we're delivering the units. It's I'm not four following weeks. this. 
So it's, it's a okay. two it's week somewhere. delay. It's somewhere more. It's somewhere is two weeks to four weeks. It takes two weeks to update the contract because it doesn't make sense. It's it's two yeah, weeks to update two, the contract. Two weeks after the contract, so that's at least three weeks. So the fourth week would be the delivery time for the devices to be in the school. Okay. I don't. I'm, I'm, Mrs. Causey. I don't know if I'm am I wrong. You're okay. One day. This is one of the reasons why. I ask for information in advance and information. Mic yes, okay. my mic is on. This is one of the reasons why it, it's really important for the superintendent and staff to make available to the board the information that is requested. The light's on. Is that working now? Thank you. This is one of the reasons why it's very important for the superintendent and the staff to provide the board the information that we need to understand the timelines. I look at this situation and say, you're bringing this to the board too late. And it doesn't make sense, Mr. Brown, that if we postpone a contract by two weeks, that it takes, then its delivery is going to be four weeks later. So that's a situation that is going to have to be worked out with, with the vendor. I mean, it, to, to that point, the contract stipulates when we'll have it out. If we're changing what we're going to do in the RFP by, by delaying it, now we have to go back to the provider to see can they accommodate the new delayed date. So we're, we're telling you what we think we can do, but we, we, we can't speak for that vendor because our RFP spoke for a certain date when it would be approved. So please don't hold us to these dates specifically because we still have to renegotiate with that vendor provider that they can meet a new timeline. So there, that the dates are going to be a little bit fluid until we can find out what that new date is going to be. Okay, and I think that that's an acceptable, an acceptable uh, term to consider given that right now we know nothing about the device, we know nothing about the service model, we know nothing about the implementation, and we're waiting to hear the presentation. So I think what's important is for the board to understand the full ramifications of this program, this contract, to make sure that it's right before we vote. And there is no way I can tell you that we're going to go through all of these scenarios and come to an evaluation and conclusion. For the things that um, I asked for last week, it says the material will be available at a designated web location for board members. At another issue, the RFP and response submitted for daily computers, due to the proprietary and confidential nature of this information, the release of this information is being reviewed by the law office. So there's information that we're being told tonight we're not going to have tonight. And so for board members to think that they sh can make an $140 million decision without complete information and time to evaluate it and time for follow-up questions and follow-up answers is, <clears throat> is negligent to make a decision like that. So given what the timeline is, we'll have to work with it the way it is. I mean, we, we need to get this right. We cannot <coughs> be rushed. And, and this system has done this to the board over and over. I mean, how many times, Miss Eaton, have you and when Romaine Williams were sitting here were saying, gee, I wish you'd gotten the information to us sooner. Mrs. Eaton. Did you get the information to us sooner? Mrs. Eaton and then Mr. Stewart. Thank you. Do we get to see the actual contract or are we just stuck with this page and a half? Um, the, the information that's going to be online, that's a lot of information in addition to that. Some of that information is proprietary to that company, so some of that information has to be redacted before we can provide it to the board because it's their proprietary information and confidential information. So we're not withholding anything from the board. We just have to make sure that that redaction of all of that proprietary information is done prior to that information, and it will be uploaded to the website tomorrow morning so for the board to access. Okay, and um, often when we send out bids, we get to see the companies and their bids, and we received five bids. Do we get to see the five different companies and their bids? Yeah, yes, that was part of the information that's being loaded, right? Be, yeah. Correct. Okay, thank you. Mr. Stewart. So just to take a step back, I think if you look at the situation as it stands, we have a contract with a significant import, $20 million a year for seven years. We have an administration who is advising us that a two-week extension will not put us in the most significant of jeopardy with respect to legal implications. And we have an administration who has prepared information, is 
eager and interested in getting us information that we need and has also l set forth a process to do so. Uh, I think we ought to trust that and understand that we're going to come to the best decision possible because we engaged in this process in a collaborative way. So the, the uh, committee's recommendation is to receive the report tonight from the staff, but to delay or defer board action until uh, March 20. All, is there, are we ready for a vote? All in favor of that recommendation from the contracts committee, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, the motion carries. Very good. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to have a few remarks before the team starts. Again, if you know me, you know that I'm really excited about uh, our focal areas this uh, school year in terms of literacy and climate. Uh, if you know me, you also know that there are times when I have to correct the record. So before the team even gets started, I do want to take some time to do that because I think in leadership it's required and it's the responsible thing to do from time to time. So in terms of literacy and climate, all efforts have been geared toward reading, writing, listening, speaking across the disciplines and sometimes that means doing so in a responsible and transparent um, manner making sure that there is uh, this true transformation of teaching and learning occurring so that we can truly prepare our kids for college and career readiness uh, this year we've had multiple community meetings and to listen and to learn more about our priorities as a result as they relate to literacy and climate and during those meetings consistent themes have emerged parents and Community members want their children to be highly engaged in learning. Um, they clearly want students to use, to be able to use technology. They want them to be able to use technology responsibly, as do we. There is no effort to have kids kind of droning on and on on a device. There is no effort toward that. We're talking about a balanced instructional program for, uh, for students. They also want students to be in a safe and orderly learning environment. Those are some of the key themes um, we have met with multiple parents and multiple forms throughout the school year. Tonight, as, um, as you've just voted on, the board will receive a presentation related to student and teacher devices. Now, I know that BCPS has been in the news lately, um, but I want to urge everyone, board members included, to stay focused on our students and what's best for our overall team and for what's, what's best for our students as well. Let's do our level best uh, to unite and to only dwell in the facts. Um, the fact of the matter is that, yes, we've had two um, individuals in the news lately. We have almost 21,000 employees and so we've had two members in the news we just have to keep some perspective here but the fact of the matter is also that none of the issues presented again I'm not here to defend anyone or anything that is not my role here but as the leader of the school system I do have to set the record straight when it comes to those issues those issues have nothing to do and they have absolutely nothing to do with our uh, contracts or our procurement process I know that there are those who are trying to put all BCPS leaders in the same frame However, that premise is misguided. The facts are inconsistent with their assertions as they attempt to make generalizations about our school system that are faulty. Keep in mind that we honor and appreciate the questions that have been posed. As taxpayers, we are supposed to ask tough questions and hold our leaders accountable. However, some questions and the way that they're being posed are sometimes posed in a way to intentionally be divisive and intentionally being uh, destructive and intentionally be uh, damaging, not only to the leaders of the school system, but many times to other um, school system personnel and I do think that that is unfair. The uh, bottom line is that our procurement process has been tested and has been audited has been audited every single year. I don't think that there's any auditing firm that's willing to put their reputation on the line for BCPS. So again, this notion that BCPS hasn't been audited, that is just a faulty claim and it is untrue. The fact of the matter is that I called for an independent audit on September 26 to provide the public with greater assurances related to our procedures. Therefore, there is no fear about of an audit. We have welcomed an audit. 
audit. We have welcomed an audit since September. We will continue to do so. The process, I believe, the scope of the, next, the independent audit is already underway. So again, we welcome those auditing processes to assure our public of our processes. So whatever we can do to maintain and rebuild public trust, we will do. In the meantime, it is my hope that we can stay focused on the goal of providing a high quality educational program in a safe and orderly learning environment for all of our students by dwelling only in the facts and by refraining from making generalizations based on misleading information. Our students are depending on us to be logical, reasonable, and responsible, and united. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our team. I welcome our team to take us through the factual information that we know to be right and true related to the de device selection process. I do think that this presentation will shed a lot of light on how we go about, um, how we've gone about selecting this device, how we've gone about selecting the distributor, and to answer a lot of the questions. So I would just ask everyone to keep an open mind and let's unite as we um, hear the, pr the presentation. So good evening, I'm Mary McComas and I'm joined this evening by uh, George Saris and Kevin Smith and we are here this evening to present to you uh, the proposal for our new devices um, in service of support of our teaching and learning processes. We know that you have questions and please, we ask that you hold your questions until the end of the presentation. I have to get myself coordinated here. Blended instruction is the 21st century approach to providing equitable access and resources that support differentiated instruction for each and every child. As board members, you recognize upon graduation that our students must be competitive both locally and globally for colleges and more importantly, their careers. You want to be certain that our investment is appropriate and you'd like to understand how we have arrived at our contract recommendation. In this presentation, we will walk you through the why, what, and how of this contract recommendation as outlined on the screen. Blended instruction is a model reflective of the reality of the 21st century. Our students live in and will pursue careers in which technology is a constant resource, not merely for information and entertainment, but more critically for their productivity in a manner that is frankly unparalleled by previous generations. Our students' ability to leverage technology to communicate, collaborate, create, and critically think will be the decisive skill set that either propels them or constrains their economic prosperity as individuals and ultimately for all of us as a nation. We knew at the outset that it would be important to have an independent evaluation of the STAT initiative. And for the past three years, Johns Hopkins University Center for Research and Education has provided regular updates to you, the board, and our community on the progress of the implementation of the STAT initiative. This year's reports were particularly important in that this was the first year that our evaluation expected to see improvements in student achievement. <coughs> the quote before you on the screen comes directly from the summary of the year three report from Johns Hopkins. As you can see, in year three of STAT implementation, progress clearly seems to be meeting and often exceeding expectations. Prominent strengths of the initiative include increases in student engagement, a focus on instruction and student-centered learning, and a variety of options and resources available for teachers to support learning. So what has been the impact on student achievement? Despite, despite claims to the contrary, the gains in student achievement have been substantial. Before the STAT initiative began, our students in the Lighthouse Elementary Schools had, on average, lower achievement scores compared to their peers both across BCPS as a system and across the nation as measured by MAP. In the charts above, or before you, the blue bars represent the average score in mathematics for our Lighthouse Elementary <coughs> students at the midpoint of the first year during the 2014-2015 school year. The green bars, on the other hand, represent the average scores of Lighthouse students at the midpoint of the third year during the 2016-2017 school year. 
The gray bars represent the average scores obtained by students across the nation at each grade level. In grades one through three, our Lighthouse students were on average performing below their peers and across the nation in year one, which was the 2014-15 school year. However, we see that by the third year, in 2016-2017, achievement in all three grades had surpassed the national average. These gains are equivalent to hundreds of hours of additional instruction. For example, gaining 7.7 .7 points in achievement in first grade is what would be expected of students if they had an additional 62 days of instruction in first grade. It is the equivalent of adding approximately 35% more time to the school calendar. The gain we see in second grade was nearly the equivalent of an additional half of year of instruction, while the smallest gain in third grade still reflects the equivalent of an additional 51 days of instruction. <coughs> As expected, the Lighthouse schools have received devices and training one year earlier uh, than the other schools. And, uh, which show gains before, um, so the Lighthouse schools show gains uh, ahead of the other schools. Our remaining BCPS non-Lighthouse schools have, however, demonstrated gains in achievement as well, a full year uh, ahead of what was expected from the logic model. In mathematics specifically, the non-Lighthouse schools show gains equivalent to an additional 37 days of instruction in grades one to th through three at year two of implementation. This pattern we see continues in reading where again, our students in Lighthouse schools were performing below their peers in the system and compared to across the nation prior to the STAT initiative. After three years, the students in the Lighthouse elementary schools were on average outperforming their peers across the district and across the nation. These gains in achievement effectively add instructional time ranging from the equivalent of 45 days of additional instruction in second grade up to 64 days of additional instruction in first grade. As expected, the Lighthouse schools, having received devices and training a year prior to the other schools, show gains before the remaining schools in the system. The remaining BCPS non-Lighthouse schools have, however, demonstrate gains in achievement as well, a full year of what was expected from the logic model. More specifically, in reading, the gains were equivalent to an additional 30 days of instruction in grades one through three. Gains in achievement were not just observed on map assessment, they were also observed on park assessment. As reported by Johns Hopkins University Center for Research and Reform and Education, <coughs> students in our Lighthouse School showed improvement in achievement that outpaced their counterparts around the state and in comparable systems. As outlined in our logic model, students in grades one to three were expected to begin to show improvements in achievement in the third year of the program. And as expected, these students did show an improvement in achievement over three years from 2014-15 school year through to the present. Specifically last school year, the Lighthouse student's achievement in third grade mathematics was 15.4 percentage points higher than it was at the start of the program. And during this same window of time, achievement only rose 6.6 .6 percentage points across the entire state. BCPS Lighthouse students, therefore, did demonstrate over twice the change in achievement during this window of time. Additionally, while grades four and five were only in their second year of implementation and were not expected to see gains in achievement, they too outperform counterparts around the state and in comparable systems, showing a full 16 percentage points of gain in achievement in fourth grade and 11.5 percentage points of gain in fifth grade. These gains were observed a year ahead of expectation. Across the three grades, Lighthouse students gained twice as much ground in achievement than observed by their counterparts around the state during the same window. Likewise, a similar pattern for reading um, exists, where Lighthouse students' achievement raised at three times the rate of the state as a whole. 
our third and fourth grade Lighthouse students during the 2016-2017 school year showed a 6.9 percentage point gain, while in fifth grade, Lighthouse students demonstrate an increase of 4.4 percentage points over the achievement that was observed in Park in the 2014-15 school year. The achievement results are quite clear, and on every associate measure of achievement, all 12 in fact, our Lighthouse students have shown substantial gains relative to their peers both across the state and across the nation. In addition to the clear evidence of progress outlined by Johns Hopkins, our parents, as demonstrated in our stakeholder survey, clearly support the use of technology in our schools. 84.9% or 8,491 of our parents responded that they agreed or strongly agreed that access to technology increases opportunities for making learning more personalized for our students. Furthermore, we see 80.8% .8 or 8,041 parents agreed or strongly agreed that teachers are able to use technology to meet the needs of all students. Now that we have examined the why of this contract proposal, we'll next look to the what and the how of this proposal, beginning with Mr. Kevin Smith. Thank you, Dr. McComas. <coughs> Let's take a deep breath. Now you've heard the why. Now let's talk about the what. What is our current implementation? Let's first review which groups of teachers, staff, and students have devices through the current lease and contract, beginning with our students. All kindergarten students have access to a pod of six devices in each classroom. All students in grades one through eight have devices and all three Lighthouse high schools have devices grades 9 through 12. During the first year of the lease, which is the spring of 2014, classroom teachers and administrators receive their devices. Related, related service providers and other supporting staff receive devices during subsequent years. For example, OT, PT, counselors, psychologists, all of those. What's included in the devices under the current existing contract? The current device contract for teachers, administrators, and students is a HP Resolve with an 11-inch screen that can rotate flat to, a, to create a tablet. Included with the device is a four-year four warranty covering manufacturer's defects, a four-year accidental damage protection plan, four years of tracking protection for theft, and a four-year on-site support by technicians hired by the device. Why now? As you look at this graphic, why we must act now? The lease ends, this lease ends June 30th, 2018. Therefore, we do, we do need to reissue a lease to our teachers, administrators, and elementary Lighthouse students who will not have a device next year. In addition, the remaining high schools would be denied the opportunity to have a device. This would directly impact approximately 50,000 students, teachers, and administrators. As a result, the request for proposal process was initiated. As you look at this graph here, it shows how the rollout of our existing contract took place over that time. Next, I will ask Mr. Saris to explain the RFP process that we're currently involved in. Thank you, Mr. Smith. How is the selection process conducted? It's outlined here. The Office of Purchasing coordinated the selection process in complete accordance with board policies and rules 3209, 3210, and related procedures, including the development of bid specifications, evaluation criteria, advertising, etc. Each device and vendor was evaluated based on the criteria in the RFP, including functionality, implementation plan, support services provided, dem and demonstration requirements. Demonstration and written response feedback scores were tallied by the Office of Purchasing to provide a total score for each vendor product combination. 
pricing was sealed and secured by the Office of Purchasing until all other criteria had been fully evaluated. Members of the Department of Information Technology evaluated the devices to determine if they met the functionality specifications in the RFP. The ease with which the device could be repaired and the device's durability. Technology liaisons, members of career technology education, and the Departments of Innovative Learning were invited to evaluate the devices side by side to compare functionality. Vendors provided on-site demonstrations for teachers, administrators, curriculum and instruction staff, and stakeholders who evaluated the devices. The RFP evaluation criteria are listed here. Uh, all points were weighted accordingly. Requests for best and final offers were made to all four responsive and responsible vendors, thus providing an opportunity for all vendors to reduce their pricing further if desired. Once best and final offers were received, the scores were tallied for a final total. Based on the final composite scores, Daily Computers Incorporated was clearly the highest rated proposal and the most highly rated device by students, teachers, and administrators alike. The criteria included, as listed, functional requirements, experience of firm and the firm's staff, implementation plan, price, demonstration, and presentation, and overall quality of proposal. The proposal was designed to identify the best instructional tool at the best price. As noted, price is not the only criteria, and on all criteria except price, Daly scored the highest. Nonetheless, the price of $906 per unit is approximately one-third lower than the price of the current student device. So who was involved in the RFP process? Literally hundreds. Specifications were developed by focus groups that included 227 teachers, school administrators, students, and parents. Additional feedback was provided by over 300 attendees at the 2017 STAT Institute. And most importantly, 80 students from elementary, middle, and high schools participated in field testings and demonstration. Our stakeholders included teachers, TABCO, administrators, CASE, the Special Education Citizens Advisory Committee, the Citizens Advisory Committee for Gifted and Talented Education, and the Parent Teacher Association Council of Baltimore County, all of whom participated in the evaluation and scoring. In addition, our central office administrators from the following departments were participants. Information Technology Facilities Management, Food Service, research, accountability, and assessment, academics, academic services, special education, school counseling, innovation and digital safety, and business management information systems. Who responded to the RFP? Four vendors successfully made it through the first round of evaluations conducted by purchasing and went on to the second round of evaluations that included written proposals, vendor demonstrations, and student and staff evaluations. What device was selected? They're displayed here this evening. Uh, the smaller device, darker colored, is the student device, and the larger device is the uh, teacher and staff device. That teacher and staff device is a 14-inch HP Elite book. And the uh, device recommended for students, based on feedback from staff and students themselves, is an 11-inch HP Pro book. Each proposed device will come with a four-year manufacturer's warranty, including the long-life battery, four years of accidental damage protection, covering all damage other than that which is intentional, and four years of tracking software for devices that may be stolen. The vendor must provide readily available parts to repair devices and provide off-site support. Internal technology support will be provided by BCPS support technicians. The services that are included in the price are listed here. The proposed vendor partner, Daily Computers Incorporated, will provide a number of value-added services as part of the new contract. 
all of the services are included in the cost of the proposed contract. The Department of Information Technology will manage the contract to ensure that all services provided meet BCPS standards. As part of the contract and to provide a smooth transition, an additional 20 technicians will be provided by daily computers from mid-March through June 30th. The technicians will be managed by BCPS Department of Information Technology staff and will assist with the distribution and collection of 11,000 teacher and staff devices and to provide adequate training in advance of the school year. The proposed student devices before you contain the features that teachers and students most requested, such as durable cases, camera features, tablet mode, and interactive touch screen. Likewise, the teacher device before you um, um, contains the features that teachers most requested, such as a larger screen size, <coughs> durable case, tablet mode, and also interactive touch screen. Now let's talk about the contract savings. The new device cost per day per student is about 33% less lower than the existing, showing a savings of about $19.6 million over the first four years of the contract, contract. As you can see from this graphic here, the existing device um, was about, is about, about $1.83 cost per day when the new device that we're recommending to you today is about a dollar and 23 cent per day for our students. Now let me put that in perspective. That's about the, the cost of a cup of coffee daily, your daily cup of coffee um, for that dollar and 23 cent. The cost per day is based on the old, the old device total of um, 1348 and the new device cost of six, six, um, 906 dollars spread over four years divided by 184 student school days. Four year savings projected at the 19.8 million dollars. Might I add, 19.8 million dollars over the first four years of the contract. Oh, sorry. Next, oh, let's okay. look at. Is there a buyout on that, not included in those numbers? Say, it, say again now. Is there a buyout on that, not included in those numbers? There is not a buyout, no. So way. that's a dead end of contract. That is the end of the contract, yes, sir. The BCPS service model, as you see here on the screen, that's something that we work closely to. We work, that's how we do our business with our service model. Supporting technology requires all areas of BCPS working together to strengthen school capacity and central office ability to address student and teacher technology concerns. The current technology support model continues to be evaluated alongside other industry standard support <coughs> models. In all cases, the focus of support for technology in BCPS schools is quality, timely, and complete service. The highlights. All of our students grades one through 12 will have a device assigned to them. Additional vendor services included at a lower cost, an 11 inch device for staff and teachers, long life battery with a four year warranty, summer refresh assistance, staff device um, rollout support, and as I mentioned before, a cost savings of nearly $20 million. While you review these highlights, let us recognize technology is constantly changing. With those changes come additional features, of course, at a lower cost at some kind. While it is possible as a consumer to find technology at a lower price in the retail store or maybe online, but keep in mind, the devices that I've just passed around to you now, those are commercial grade products that can, that can tolerate the wear and tear of students and teachers' everyday busy lives in delivering instruction and students working on it. So in conclusion, let us acknowledge that our students currently live in and will absolutely compete in a technologically demanding world. As board members, you must decide if our students will have the full benefit of developing adept skills for navigating the reality of the 21st century. 
providing students continuity in and access, equitable access to resources that meet their individual needs will propel their prosperity as already demonstrated in academic achievement. It effectively provides our students compounding interests when it comes to learning. You have in fact the opportunity to provide each child an education unmatched by previous generations. In order to do so, we must sustain equitable access to differentiated instructional resources, leveraging technology. And lastly, I would like to uh, sincerely express a thank you to the hundreds of people involved in the feedback and selection process. As Mr. Saris said, we had over 600 people um, involved in this process. At this time, we'll open up for questions. Board members have questions at this juncture? Mrs. Causey. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much to, um, to each of you for that presentation. And we definitely want to thank all of the teachers and students and the staff and other folks that volunteered to be a part of the process. And that is uh, tremendously important as we move forward in making sure that the needs are met and that the uh, requirements are met. I did have some questions and um, I wanted to understand how the services are similar or different from the previous contract. You had talked about uh, at one point it said 20 support personnel. Is that 20 additional support personnel? What was the model before and, and what is proposed now? Well, because this is our largest deployment um, of 48,000 devices and because uh, we are at the uh, end of the teacher and administrator lease and want to make sure that we meet teachers' needs uh, well in advance of the school year. There is in the first quarter uh, of the proposal between March and June an additional 20 technicians supplied as part of the contract price and these these staff may remain into the fall and, and mid-year point to make sure that uh, everything is in place and fully supported. And then after year one, uh, those we would uh, revert back to our current staffing levels. But we would be adding the staff that we need to support the high schools. That's part of the proposal as well because they're not currently supported, but the 20 would be a, a temporary addition. The 20 would be temporary, so that's on page one of the answers. <coughs> Indicate how much staffing is included in yes. each from responsive. 3C. Okay, mm -hmm. so the certified repair technicians will provide 20 for implementation. Correct. Okay, so Correct. after the first year they go away. Correct. Now, when you say they may stay, is that a, an additional option we can purchase later or? No, no. no. Okay. And then when you say 48,000 devices, what number of that is teachers? What number of that is administrators? Uh, about 36,000 are students, uh, about 11,000 are teachers and staff, and somewhere I have the rest of those numbers, but that's uh, most of them. Um, okay, while you look for that, I can ask another yeah, 36, question. 36,160 students, 12,000 uh, staff. I think it's actually an attachment. Um, I think it's on the, the last page of your questions. Uh, there's a chart across the top which shows the number of devices. So we have, well, this says 12,000 under teachers. Yes, that's correct. But does that include, because I thought we had 9,000 certificates. Teachers, and, teachers and, administrators. and administrators. Uh, principals, assistant principals, central okay. office staff. All right, so that's teachers and administrators. All right. And they each have devices now that are going to be uh, confiscated old. June 30th. 2018. Correct. Okay. Uh, confiscated is kind of a harsh term, but uh, <laughs> they will be recollected and returned. <laughs> Ideally, but refreshed. it's 9,000 teachers. Yes. Okay. 
And then um, would it be possible to receive an updated, um, what was previously called the digital conversion um, six-year plan, to have that updated with these numbers? Um, well, the chart is um, the seven-year uh, term of the proposed contract, that attachment at the back. Yes, but you know how we have this spreadsheet that adds up all of the oh, stat yes. costs? Yes, we can do that. Okay. I think that's in process and should be complete. Okay, because my point is if uh, we are realizing savings, then we would want to um, have the board consider what to do with those savings in terms of making a recommendation uh, to the county government if there's a difference in what we already sent them the savings, in the budget. The savings is cost avoidance, not, not extra money at the end. The savings is cost avoidance. We didn't need to increase the spending authority. So the spending authority is theoretically $20 million less than what it would have been. The 140 would have been 160 if we, would have, if we wouldn't have had that savings. So you're saying that in the spreadsheet that we received during the budget conversations, that that had these exact numbers in them? No. 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 Okay. So then with these new numbers from this actual proposed contract, mm -hmm. can we receive an updated stat spreadsheet? That's the six-year one that, that okay. you just indicated. Yeah. Right. That's what and we're if, doing okay. with that. If you look at that chart on that attachment, I don't uh, – if you look at 2022, mm -hmm. the, when, the, when the new lease is fully implemented, we save – $10.7 million a year in the chart that you're referencing from the budget. Okay, but you can put it all together for us. Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, and you mentioned that these units are commercial grade. Is that different than before? Same as before. The, the ones that we have now are commercial grade products. And the ones that we gave to our students and teachers before were also commercial grade? That is correct. Okay. And I didn't have an opportunity to go through the questions that I asked and the questions that you provided, and I don't want to take the time to do that now, but if there are questions that got missed, I'd like the opportunity to submit additional questions and get responses. Let's do it the same way we did it before. If you get it by the end of the weekend, they'll get it to you by the <coughs> beginning of the next week. That's great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'll um, allow other people to ask questions. Thanks. Are there other questions now? Mrs. Miller. Uh, yes. Hang on here. Um, I had um, I had distributed this spreadsheet analysis to the board members, and you might have seen it. Um, I took I took the uh, numbers that you gave us from the contract summary from 2014, um, which had a breakdown by year of what the expected expenditures were going to be. And it was through seven years. So that $205 million was supposed to last us for seven years. Is that correct? Correct. correct. That spending authority. And then and we're on projecting that we will have spent $163 million. We've spent to date around $111 million, but we still have three years remaining on the subsequent to get to the seven-year term, which will bring it to the $162 million, which is on the contract exhibit that you have here. So the comment that we have, uh, I think the, the term was burned through. <laughs> or overspent uh, Or overspent, that's incorrect. That is incorrect. That's incorrect. Well, well, you had told us that to date you've spent about $113 million is what you provided on the uh, contract summary for the new contract. Um, I'm, you have to point that number out to me. We, we show 162.9 million. Um, why we put that number there was because to date is 111 million, but it's a little bit misleading 
because we still have three years left in the subsequent cycles. So we put the 162 million because that's the total cost for the entire run out of the lease. So for the next three years, you're saying you're going to be spending 50 million for the, the next balance, three so years. Balance, correct. Where in the first four years you spent 111 million. Correct. Okay, so by my calculations, based on the budget document for the work session that you gave us mm -hmm. that showed the annual lease costs and the breakdown per year, I pulled those numbers so we would have an annual that, estimate. That's a projection. We're, we're right. telling you what the, we're telling you what the actual cost of around $111 million, and then the additional cost related to those subsequent years would be $162 million. So I, I know what you, the, the, the point you're related to was a projected cost when we were started in the earlier years and we just kept moving. This, this here, I want you to know that this is the actual cost plus the additional rollout right, years. But, but on ahead. your budget document, it projected, I think it was 48 million per, for this, for this year as an, so that, that's about, so, so if it's divided by 12 months, that's 4 million per month. Well, I haven't seen what you're, what you distributed, but if you put it in the form of a question and give me your numbers. Well, I'm trying I'll to. So do that for that's you. 4 million per month for this year. There's four months remaining on this fiscal year. So when you take your per year expenditures, mm -hmm. then there's four more months at four million per month. That's 16 million more that you're gonna be spending just to complete this year. The, the, the total cost to date is 111 million. The additional years that we have remaining plus the additional months will equate to the additional will equate to the $162.9 million. So however you want to break that out, whether it's $4 million a month or whatever that may be, the, the difference between 111 and 162 is what's going to be the remaining cost related to the existing contract that we're in that will end June 30th. Yes, ma'am. I'll be happy to provide you the projected cost through the current fiscal year if that's part of your question. Not jiving with what you <laughs> gave us in the budget document for the work session. Well, I will look at that million document for and this try coming to year, your question. Up to 60 million for the next couple of years. You know, it, it ranged. So, so uh, if you can provide that in writing before, at, by, you know, Monday morning, they'll be able to, instead of us kind of being challenged with only some of us having charts and the like, they'll be able to analyze and respond to your questions. Okay, well, my question is, because by my analysis, you will have, in, you will have spent 180 million by July 1st. Well, we, di we disagree, but we'll have to see your information in order yeah, to I respond to I think that your analysis it. is inaccurate, um, Ms. Miller. Um, based on our analysis, we've, uh, we've been pretty forthright with what we've spent thus far, um, about $111 million to date, and again, $162 million by the, um, by by the, the end of the contract. Term. That's right. So I believe your, your analysis is faulty. All right, well, you'll have to explain that to me because I'm going by the information you provided us for the operating budget on well, that page 14 so that shows the stat we'll program. We'll be more than happy to respond. Um, but that, you know, okay, okay. that's alarming to me. Um, and that, okay, we'll look at that. Um, Excuse me, can I dovetail with that, Ms. Miller? Yes. That Please. Um, I think part of the um, uh, part of the confusion in the conversation is that of the one and a half page document that we got last week regarding this 140 million dollar contract, it says at the bottom the average annual expenditures on the contract were 40 million and change, yeah. and total contract expenditures were 162 million. What? Is, and, and this has happened in other contracts as well. It's not helpful to have the average annual expenditures, especially when they are so different year to year. So it would be more helpful 
not just here but in going forward, to have the actual years. If we have a seven-year contract and we're in year four, then give us the actual for year one, two, three, and four, and then give us the going forward, you know, five, six, seven. So very logical, Ms. Miller. Yes, right. thank you. So very and that's logical. part of where the confusion comes from, because if yeah. you start at the 162, yes. Absolutely. So if you can And I do apologize. This that, is not clear. Thank you. And it's, and it's happened before. So, um, so I think that will be helpful. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, for having us be able to, to get that, because that's important, because we're talking about it, what are the projections, what are the actuals, what does it mean for the future of the system if we end up going over budget, or if we end up coming in under budget, what have we decided is the next step uh, for what we, our priorities are. Very good. Can I ask a fast question? The, the existing yeah. contracts, when we initiated the initi initial contract, when we initiated it, 2014? Yes, sir. The spending authority was $205 million. Correct. Do I understand you correctly? You're now telling me that by the end of that seven-year contract, that we will, we will have spent $162 million. Right. That is That's correct. correct. So the spending authority... The, the, the numbers out there people were talking about, you spent $205 million is a lot of BS, as they're saying on television now. So uh, <laughs> we're really going to spend $162 million. So will people... 20, 20%. Point of order, Mr. Cherry. Could you have him elaborate on what those yeah, initials I'll stand for? I'll elaborate to you later. <laughs> well, so, so what I'm hearing, I mean, I hear people coming up with, with these numbers, the $205 million spent. Well, we didn't spend two, and we're not going to spend. We're going to well, spend $162 million. Yeah, let me just explain the primary reason for that. And that is that the original proposal was a four-year rollout that included the high schools. And we deferred the high schools until FY19. And that's really the major uh, missing between. piece right. there. Mr. McDaniels and then Mrs. Causey. Uh, thank you. Um, I just wanted to make sure I understood the device evaluation. There were four vendors that bid, but three different types of devices, and all three of those devices were evaluated by that team that you mentioned. Uh, correct. Correct. Okay. Thank you. So two vendors proposed the, the same device. I don't care how All right. Are there more questions now, knowing that we can submit questions later? Mrs. Miller. Now I'm reading from board docs for this meeting, and if you scroll down, to the description that at the bottom of the description area it says the average I forget the average the total contract expenditures this is to date correct no, are, no that's seven no, yeah this that's is, what that's what this Mrs. Causey said is a is a unclear statement and they're going to clear that up but that's the expectation for seven years right even though the average of 40 times four years is 160. Right. That was a and poorly you're constructed. The total that's not a right number. Right. That, we need to clarify that so that's clear because the it's average was based on when we do in other contracts when we have a dollar amount for the total spend and we say on average that's what it is. But Ms. Causey's um, suggestion was for this particular one here, list what each year was for those years. And then we don't have to put an average there because the average is confusing relative to the total. And you got another component because now you're adding subsequent years that have not been paid yet. All right. And when I go to the 2014 contract summary and it lists out year one through seven what you expected to spend, year four you were expected to spend $50 million. That sounds right. Year five you were expected to spend $43 million. That sounds correct because Year we're six, unwinding 32. it in that, in that example as the leases expire that was premised on not renewing. And year seven, 13 million. Well, if you add up what you listed for the last three years, that's 86, 88 mil, over 88 million, about $90 million. But you're saying that you're only going to be spending 50 million Again, that original plan had high schools within that 
um, four-year uh, cohort. So again, those numbers from 2014 <coughs> would be different than what we're presenting to you today because we delayed the high schools by a year. We didn't change the we didn't change the worksheet that you're talking about that was in the budget document because we didn't want to confuse the any of the public, we wanted to show what was originally there and we just altered what the implementation was. This is not making sense to me. <laughs> Nothing of what you've provided us matches up. To what? I can't make heads well, or tails Well, you're talking about a four-year-old document and we're talking about a new <coughs> proposal. So the numbers are going to be different based on the changes that have occurred over the past four years. The primary feature which is deferring the high schools. Okay, so if the rollout was supposed to be, what, last year, according to the original document? For high school, correct. So that would have been in year three? Four. Year four. Year four. Okay, that's the 50 million. And then the last three years was what? What, there was no... You, you mean... It would just be... Continued 20, rollout, just 2019, up. 2020, and 2021. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the rollout would have been completed that before you. That was just so, the continued so, rollout? No, so, that so. was the winding down. That was the expiration of leases. Okay, that so number the number decreased. Expiration the, of leases would have been $90 million, but now we're faced with the actual rollout, and you're saying. Well, with the actual rollout included, it's only going to be 50. We're it talking about less. a different contract. Yeah. But it should be less, not. I, I All right, have so, to, I'm going so to have to, you're going to have to ask me a question. Mr. Saris, a couple of things. Uh, one is perhaps you can provide us with uh, electronic version of the <laughs> PowerPoint you just showed us mm -hmm. because that schedule of four years and, and, and stair-stepping things explains in part that there are four-year leases that would have expired and needed to be uh, needed to be renewed. And it's Mr. part Chair. of the questions that were permitted sum, right. submitted as well by Mrs. Causey. So that that answer to that question, Ms. Causey had a similar question that is in this packet of questions that the board got tonight as well. Mrs. Miller. Yes, one of my other questions. Does the new contract cover device breakage and replacement? It does. The same way, in the same fashion? It does. Mm -hmm. uh, because I, I understand that that has been one of the rising costs because it was more than we were expecting. <coughs> but it was, in, it was within the coverage of the existing contract so that there's nothing that we have that is significant than or accreted additional costs to our already existing contract. We, we had nothing to change that contract. Okay. Um, can you explain why the term is seven years, three months, when we're, the devices are only going to be basically in service for four years? That's the th three months between what would have been tonight and uh, to the end of the year and then the remaining seven years. But why seven years? Why is it not four years if the devices are expected to last for four it's years? I'll, I'll, I'll try to do this quickly. Um, we have, we implemented the uh, STAT initiative and it had four components to it. Each component has a four-year lease option. For example, in 2014, teachers and administrators and the Lighthouse High Schools got devices. Got devices. At that time, that was a four-year lease that would, that would expire in four years. The following year, we had other individuals related to the implement, uh, the Lighthouse um, um, Middle Schools and the other elementary schools. They got devices. Their device is in year one. So now we have the first year and the second year, and then we had devices that went out the second year. So each, each year we issued devices to different levels. They had a four-year cycle. So that four-year cycle for all of them plays out in seven years. The first year ends in four, the second year ends in five, the third year ends in six, and the fourth year ends in seven. Mm -hmm. so and that's, that's what's delineated on the screen. And that's what's delineated on the screen. And that's so the timeline. 
on the screen. So can you explain how that's going to work when we have the old devices that are still, some of them still active, mm -hmm. right? Yes. With the new devices coming in, if we end this, the old contract, what will happen to those old devices? Will the, they come and collect them? Correct. Mm -hmm. June 30th of 2018, everyone who received the, their devices in 2014, their devices go away and they get new devices. How about the people that received them in subsequent years? Will as, they still as have As their lease them? rolls out, they don't get new devices in next year, they get new devices the following year. But they're not, they're still going to have their old devices. Correct. They're not going to come collect them. Correct. Okay. Mrs. Causey. Thank you. Um, was there a consideration to have a different level device for the primary grades? It was. We looked at uh, different flexibilities of our offers related to um, secondary and <coughs> elementary devices. Um, so that was part of the discussion for the evaluation team. So why was it decided to have the same exact device for a kindergarten, first grader, second grader as for a high school student? Um, the technical requirements, I got to ask Lloyd to come up, Lloyd and Ryan to come up again related to that because they were in the room at that particular time. I have the microphone. Mrs. Causey. Yes. Hi, good evening. You, Mr. The, I don't know where they went. The, um, the student device that, uh, that is proposed in uh, this contract is actually the device that was brought forward by the vendor daily as the elementary school device. When we went through the process um, and we had all of the folks, our administrators, our teachers, our students, um, our parents go through the evaluation process um, and we realized uh, the difference in durability between the two devices and the cost savings associated between a 14-inch monitor and this style device and the 11-inch monitor in this particular case. Um, it was uh, an overwhelming decision by that, by that group who went through the evaluation process that this 11-inch device can work with all of our students. So from a perspective of the tools and resources that we use, access to BCPS1, um, the Windows operating system, this would have Windows 10, this device that the vendor brought forward for elementary school can work K to 12. Okay, and when you had said the price, um, Mr. Smith, about nine hundred dollars per device. Mm -hmm. Student Th device, yeah. That's the student device. And the former price under the current contract? Um, about thirteen forty eight. Forty eight. Okay. And um, the teacher device for this new proposed contract? Do you have it, a per 15, price? Uh, 15, I think 49. 1549 and I believe it's um, just give you the page number here. Um, oh, and also, are we going to receive this presentation on board docs also? Yes. Okay, great, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, the response to question 30 on page 9. Okay. Yep. And I don't have it in front of me, but I've seen it. Um, I went to a presentation um, at NASB about technology and it was from uh, someone from the Department of Education and they had a federal um, a Department of Education guideline in a per pupil cost for devices and I believe it was much less than this. So was there not a less expensive model for our primary students? I mean, I've, I've had recent students, I still have a student and the needs of computing power and so forth, they're vastly different between a primary grade and a, and a high schooler. Certainly there are multiple options, but the recommendations from the committee and the evaluation that these are the devices that we landed on. So um, certainly another vendor may have had a lower cost one, but the evaluation was not solely on price. It was based on functionality, price, 
available. Ryan's coming on all of those factors, the seven or eight factors that we have. Yeah, I, um, I also just want to make a comment that one, the process also includes there's specifications built into the RFP itself, and those specifications in the RFP come from. Um, five years of experience in terms of our student wear and tear on devices, the work that they're doing on devices, the use that our teachers have with devices. And so in the RFP, there's, there were specific specifications. And then as a RFP committee, that committee had to review the devices that the four vendors brought forward for both students and teachers. And so these are the devices that were brought forward through the RFP process. This is the student device that was chosen, and this was the teacher device that was chosen based on the devices that were put in front of the committee. Okay. Well, it makes sense that the vendor would bring forward their more expensive models, but that doesn't mean we need to buy them because, <coughs> as is pointed out constantly, we have needs all around the school system. Facilities, counselors, safety is what we have to have as our first priority. You know, we've talked about, um, Mr. Hayden had talked about additional school resource officers. Our student representative from our student government is talking about counselors and other supports. So we need to be mindful of every single dollar, not just what is it bringing here, but what is it taking away from somewhere else. So I'm not surprised that a vendor would bring forward a really robust model, but we'll have to evaluate that. Um, you know, in the coming weeks. I would also have to add, though, Ms. Causey, that our um, personnel in terms of um, teachers, administrators, as well as our parents and, and our students who were involved in it, again, helped to develop the criteria that we're looking for and that, that our teachers are looking for when they're um, using and having students use the device. So it's not just, well, we're listening to whatever company is putting, the company is putting forward, and just the opposite. We're listening to what our teachers are saying that they need in order to get the work done and be productive in the classroom for our students. So that, those specs were then included in the RFP, and that's how the companies uh, decided which uh, product to put forward. Thank you for that. All right, so uh, we've had a good discussion. Are there more questions before we move on on the agenda? Mrs. Hen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. One last question for clarification then. The requirements as um, listed in the RFP were the same for all grade levels, is that correct, for the device? Uh, and how, okay. again, trying to understand the justification the, for one device that fits the needs of both elementary and high school students. The specs on the device was a bottom, bottom minimum requirement. So we asked the vendors to supply what they would fit and what device would fit at those minimum specs for elementary K through five and then for secondary six through 12. Does that answer your question? I think so. So there were different specs for K through five versus six through 12. There was a minimum spec in the RFP. K through 12? There was K there through 12. But the K, we asked for the vendors to make sure they provided us with a device that would meet for what they thought would meet our bottom line specs for K through five and then six through 12. So, so they had the brought, option of bringing two different devices or they could have brought correct, one. Correct. As long as they met the specs. As long as they met the minimum specs. I'd just like to add to uh, a point here. Um, keep in mind that what we expect young children to do at home on devices for entertainment uh, is very different than what we expect young children to do for educational purposes in the classroom. And I just want to make sure that that point isn't missed. Um, I know as a mother, uh, myself, what my child does at home on uh, devices for recreation is very different uh, than what is expected of my child in the classroom uh, as an elementary student, even in early grades. So I just want to make sure that we are being clear that uh, there's a difference between entertainment and recreation expectations for young learners versus <coughs> educational use. Mrs. Miller. Um, so there's 20 extra support staff being provided, is that right? Yes, um, yes ma'am. So does that mean, if you divide that out, that means each of those employees have to care for 2,400 devices? 
Is they are correct? going to be in addition to the regular the staff. staff. Yeah. The, the yes. The 20 additional that we required in the RFP was to help us deploy the 50,000 units. Once that is done, those 20 will phase out. We currently have staff on contract to support the devices currently. Okay, so they're all going to work together to make sure we deploy all the units at one time and make sure we, I'm gonna use the term, handhold our teachers to make that transfer over. So those 20 will eventually go away, as George mentioned in the presentation, in the first year. They're not 20 on top of what we currently have of the 80-some staff that we currently have in the school system. So there's 80 now, about? 80, servicing yes. Servicing the, the devices that we already have. Correct. And then we're getting 40, what is it, no. 48? No, we're only getting the additional for the high schools. So those staff we're adding on, so it'll be about 87 total, okay? Because our high schools have already had devices, so we started phasing in staff in our high school level already over the last four years. So our high schools currently have a staff member assigned to them for support of the devices. So that individual in a secondary school may support up to 2,000 devices. What have those staff members been doing when there's They've no devices? They've been supporting, there? helping us with middle school, helping us in elementary school, and also supporting the technology that is in high schools, all the labs that are there currently, the, uh, anything you can plug in, basically. They've been helping us keep that maintaining of the services for our school level. So they've been supporting existing... Existing technology. These staff getting, members are not just... They're coming in to support every technology we have in addition. Getting 48,000 new devices. Because that's all existing stuff already Any that we're replacing. Any new staff to support that? We already have... We're replacing the current units that we have in year one lease. Okay, so we're only adding the total number of high school units. So that support's already in place. So how, how, what's the breakdown for just the new high school units? The new high school, new, it's just under 30,000 devices. And we, there's no additional staff to support those. No ma'am, because we've already worked it in over the last four years. I don't know what you mean by worked it in. I'm, <laughs> You're saying well, it's they, been part they're supporting of the first what's four currently year contract. there. They're supporting what's currently there. Correct. All the and we're adding 30,000 new devices and not getting any new staff. Still a high school would be or just under 2,000 devices and in person would have to support. That's been like that since okay. probably I, 2000. Not to beat two, a dead horse, two, but two. to ask you to explain what you have in your budget document where it says the average annual expenditures were 41 million. Is that to date, or is that after seven years? That's, that was an that's a that's a inaccurate statement, and it was an average because there was a big beginning year, and when you average it all together, it gets to forty. But they're going to give us new numbers that show what it's been every year, consistent with Mrs. Oh, Causey's request. What did request. you mean by that? Did you mean to date, like in the first four years, that was the average? Well, that or I didn't what's mean anything by it. It's a mistake, and what happened is somebody took 162.9 million and divided it by four, not understanding th the discussion we've been having about the seven year lease period. And so that, I mean, that's why it looks like it is a, you spent it's a mistake. that entire amount. <laughs> yes. it's a, but you're saying you have not. They have spent 111, 111 million through four years, expect to spend 162 million through seven years. Yeah, which so they're going to give us more data that's going to answer those things. Does anybody have any more questions tonight, knowing that we're going to have an opportunity to write questions and get answers? Mrs. Causey, let's. Uh, Just real quickly, thank um, you. We've heard several concerns from parents over time, and I would really like to see a written response. Uh, regarding the parent concerns of security on the devices for the primary grades regard, regarding browsers um, and other um, off-task issues. We have five, six, seven, eight-year-olds who sh sh we should not be counting on them to uh, self-regulate and understand 
browsers and going to inappropriate sites. So I'd really like to understand what the security level is going to be uh, for those students. So I'd like to see that written out. What are we doing now and what can we consider in the future to make this a, 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 a better situation for the students? The other thing I wanted to ask about is when we talk about the survey, 80% of parents want this, want that, is there any comparison where you're asking the parents, would you rather have more teachers and smaller class sizes or a, you know, a robust laptop for a five-year-old? Because I think some of the, I think some of the, uh, of the survey is misleading because there aren't specific questions where parents are actually allowed to prioritize. Would you rather have this over that? Um, so I think that a lot of those questions should be asked more clearly of our parents. Um, and again, I, I, I disagree with presenting the averages of the Lighthouse schools compared to the other schools in the district because we had pre-stat some very high-performing schools in that Lighthouse pilot that those results are still very high. They were high before and they're still very high and there's other Lighthouses that are not as high and have not made as, as rapid as improvement as it sounds when you have the averages. So I, uh, I would like to see some results done Just a couple of things to that point. I, I do think that we have to honor um, our external evaluator and their method um, because they understand um, sound methodology in terms of qualitative and quantitative uh, data collection and the design. And in terms of how our parents feel in the survey, uh, keep in mind that we have heard from parents um, very directly. That's the whole point of, um, in terms of qualitative uh, information, we have had uh, a multiple uh, array of community meetings where we hear from them directly. And many times they don't say that they want either or. Um, most parents want a robust educational program for their students. They want their students to be able to use technology. They want face-to-face -face <laughs> instruction. They want small group instruction, all of wrapped in a safe and orderly learning environment in a environment that is conducive to 21st century learning. So they don't say that they want technology or a quality teacher. Our parents want want the best for their students. So okay, so that's right. It's about balancing the needs, go. the many needs, with our resources. All right. Dr. McComas, Mr. Saris, Mr. Smith, we thank you for your presentation. The board uh, appreciates all the hard work you have uh, done to get this to us. We look forward to having uh, another round of uh, written questions and written responses, and we'll revisit this on on March 20. Next on our agenda is board member comment. We'll start with Mr. Hayden. Thank you. Um, I had uh, intended to talk at some length, uh, and I probably can get it out of the way in about 45 minutes, um, about the board taking action condemning the comments that a, a former employee made because of the negative impact it has on the school system. I did hear the interim and her comments said two items, it was, it was only two items, and I assume she was referring to that. If indeed she was, the two items, could we compare only two items to, let me see, what were those two items that fell on Japan was only two items. These two items have a tremendous impact on the way people feel about education in Baltimore County. And I know many of you, if not all of you at the board table disagree with me on this, but the, the education system in Baltimore County is not one that people brag about unless they happen to be in this room. And I talk to an awful lot of people out there. So what I wanted to talk about at some length, I'm going to talk very briefly two or three more words or maybe a couple more. that. We had a 100-year record in Baltimore County of not having anything happen, 100 years. And now all of a sudden, only these two things happen. Well, golly days, only these two things were significant for their impact on the public out there uh, about the way they feel about boys and girls, about education in Baltimore County. So I think we've got to start again from scratch uh, to build that reputation back up because uh, to reiterate, 
I know you don't agree with me, but what I hear out there, people think our reputation is sort of uh, uh, lower than uh, the bottom of the pond. Uh, and since uh, I've been sick as a dog all night, waiting for this moment, I'm gone. See you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Hayden. Mrs. Miller. I'm, I'm very concerned about this device contract, and the numbers aren't adding up. The numbers we've been supplied aren't adding up. Um, and there's too many questions. We're, and we're being pressured. We were trying to be pressured tonight to accept this contract. It comes down to that every time. It's deja vu every time. There's always pressure. It's got to be done now. And there's always some big reason why it has to be done now. Um, you know, if that's the case, get us the information. Give us time. Allow us to make prudent decisions. All this force, force, force is, is nothing but a red flag. It should be a red flag for every one of us. Um, so I'm having a hard time with these numbers, especially if, if you all go back, and I'll send you the links <laughs> to the budget documents we got for the work session in early February, I guess it was. Those numbers estimated about 50 million a year and now we're being told that it'll be 50 million for the next three years. Done that up. They gave us numbers saying they spent that much, looked like in four years. All of a sudden, no, it's not four years, it was for seven. Doesn't add up. There's too many unanswered questions, uh, too many problems with the existing contract, with the implementation, the rollout, the performance, the results. I hope we get some better some better answers and uh, that we all do prudent follow-up. Mrs. Hen. No comment. Thank you. Mrs. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We um, had a, a very nice dinner with our student leadership, and they reiterated what we... Thank you. This evening we had a very nice dinner with our student leadership and they uh, talked exclusively to us about what every student has been talking about and parents and school leaders and that's safety. Safety has to be our first priority. Our students are crying out for it. Parents are advocating for it like never before. Educational leaders are having conversations, reevaluating how we do our work, what can we do better. But tragically in many cases teachers across the nation are dying for our students. We really need to appreciate the value and dedication of teachers that we have across the nation, the administrators in those buildings that love those children and will do whatever it takes. And we need to provide the support for them. We need to protect them so they don't have to make that choice. And we need to support them and we need to value them. This board is united in having safety and security as an important value, and we need to translate that into better communication with our students and our parents around what our safety mechanisms are, how we're reviewing our procedures, how we are looking at new ideas. We talked tonight with Ms. Lewis, our security director, with the students, and there are ideas and things that they are working on. We also had a climate meeting um, here last week with a number of parents that had ideas, and so we need to really focus on spending time evaluating any way that we can make things safer, and every idea needs to be on the table. Um, we also are, our student uh, member of the board had to go, but we do appreciate her communicating to us about the students' desires um, and the steps that the students are gonna be taking, whether it's this week with March 14th or whether it's marching in Washington on March 24th. I also wanted to say that I've recently enjoyed a number of school visits. I went to Lock Raven Technical Academy. I went to Carroll Manor Elementary School. Um, I also went to Lock Raven High School a week after they had the lockdown and again, we want to congratulate that new principal. She handled that lockdown flawlessly. Her entire staff, the teachers, they did everything just right. The coordination with Baltimore County Police Department was outstanding. And, and, and while we never want anything like that to happen, it was a great example of how well we can respond to an emergency. So that was very good to see. 
I also um, this week attended the governor's P20 Leadership Council in Annapolis, which is a uh, commission of education leaders chaired by the secretary of the Department of Labor, Licensing and Regulation. Um, education leaders from around the state and business leaders also with legislators work together to evalu evaluate the education system in Maryland and how we are uh, educating our children and our adults uh, to become a really great workforce for the Maryland economy. We heard a briefing from Dr. Britt Kerwin, Chairman of the Commission on Innovation and Excellent Education. What an inspiring, inspiring um, community member. We're so gr uh, honored to have him continuing to work on behalf of public education for the state of Maryland. Uh, the next thing I want to briefly mention is the audit. Uh, it was mentioned that we are making progress, um, and I'll let Mr. Ufelder comment on that. Um, we absolutely need to move forward with an independent, comprehensive audit as quickly as we possibly can. As Ms. White said, we need to rebuild the public trust and deal in the facts, and there's so many things that aren't known, and we need to know them, and not by finding out in the newspaper, but by evaluating ourselves what's happening within the system. Um, the other thing with the STEP implementation progress that was shared tonight, um, I already mentioned about the 10 Lighthouse Schools. Um, also there are some other numbers with our third grade reading that have been declining the last four years, and I don't understand how that <coughs> compares with the, uh, the success that we're talking about when the, the third year reading rate continues to go down. Um, but I do want to say that I'm grateful for the information that we've received. We do have a lot of reading to do and evaluating what comes up on um, the website tomorrow with additional information around this procurement. Again, I think it's mission critical that we evaluate all of the um, surrounding issues because we don't want to have an implementation that is disruptive to our teachers and students, but we want one that's going to run smoothly and also be mindful of our resources, our budget, and the other needs that we have um, in this very large system of ours. So thank you. Mr. Yulfader. Thank you. I'm sorry Mr. Hayden left, but for you people who have been around a while, uh, remember the names Dale Anderson and Spiro Agnew. I guess not a lot of you have been around in a while. <laughs> Is that it? <laughs> Mi Mr. 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 Hayden would say that was the county, not the school system. <laughs> okay. Mr. We talked about Baltimore County. Uh, I want to say something else, uh, and, and, uh, and I want to take complete issue yeah. with what Mrs. Miller said. Uh, I haven't found any numbers that were misleading. Um, it's a question of understanding what's being presented. Uh, I can tell you that I was around when we had the original rollout uh, of our STAT program, and uh, we have had people from all over the country, because I've attended some of the sessions, and from uh, other foreign countries uh, who have looked at our program and they actually thought it was an amazing conceived idea to lease these and to have a phased rollout uh, of the uh, computers over a seven-year period. Uh, and if you look at what was in front of you, each of those rollouts were actually four-year rollouts. So that's how you extend, and they weren't all done the same year, so that's how you get seven years on four-year blocks. But anyway, we had a great program. Um, I think it went very, very well. We had the option of delaying it, uh, depending on what circumstances were. And I'm looking forward to the next rollout. I hope it's as successful as the past was. Thank you. Mr. Stewart. Yeah, you can talk about uh, I'll say a few things. Uh, I wish Mr. Hayden was here, but Ms. Miller has also expressed a sentiment, which is that this board just rushes through things. And I think if you look at the hundreds of questions we received from board members on the operating budget, and uh, 60 plus and more coming, and the hour and a half discussion tonight, hours spent discussing the operating budget, I think th this board has committed itself um, to analyzing the issues, and I think I'd like to commend our administration for being right there with us and being supportive of that process and going through the rabbit holes, uh, those that are relevant and those that are not, um, so that we can have the information before us. So I appreciate that, um, gentlemen and ladies. Um, and I also want to commend uh, Julie on her advocacy uh, this evening, but and at other times as well. I think it's very ably done.
Mr. McDaniels. Thank you. I'd just like to say uh, briefly that um, we as a board and a system have sometimes had challenges to rally as a team around an issue, but I think when we uh, look at the safety of our students in school and making sure they get to school and come home safely, it's something that all of us on the board are committed to and all the staff, and I just look at us, as Ms. Causey said, don't um, fail to look at any alternative. Um, I think it's something that we can all get together as a team and try to improve. Um, so I look forward to doing that. Um, I was able to participate in some of the regional uh, meetings that discuss safety and um, uh, how we're addressing it. And uh, I, I, I'm really impressed with some of the proactive and preventative things that we're trying to do to make sure we don't wait for something to happen, but we try to address um, the safety of our students uh, uh, in a positive way. So I just wanted to Hopefully, all of us will work together on this particular goal to try to keep our students safe. Thanks. Mr. Virch. Thank you, Ed. Um, just, it just seems just so short while ago that there was that, that suggestion of a threat to students at our Stemmers Run Middle School and on our Kenwood High School. I had the opportunity to speak with the principal of Kenwood High School, some 200 to 250 students, although the numbers were still being compiled when I spoke with the principal. Some 200 to 250 students, their parents came, their guardians, their grandparents came to greet them, meet them, and then take them out of our Kenwood. Um, but what I think many of us need to know, and I appreciate Ms. Causey's comments about the principal of our Lock Raven High School, was that at Kenwood High School, when folks came into that, that center lobby where the seal of Kenwood High School is still in the floor, there was the principal of Kenwood, Brian Powell, to meet each and every one of, their, of those parents, those guardians, those grandparents, and talk with them. That says our, our system is about really relationships, and we build on those relationships, and I think we can build on relationships within our own board. Uh, it was a very busy week for me. I had the pleasure to go to Elmwood uh, Elementary School. They had a Black History uh, Month uh, event at the school. There was singing and there was storytelling about the Underground Railroad. And there were lots of neat things going on, including a lot of very, very good food. Uh, I left and I went to our Golden Ring Middle School that same evening for a night of innovation at Golden Ring Middle School where a new narrative is being written about uh, our middle school students there by, Sh by Charlene Mall and her staff, an energized staff. Um, if you have the chance to go to the school, I invited all of our members, but there was another event that evening, and I can understand how not everyone could, in fact, go. But speaking of Golden Ring Middle School, on the 18th of uh, April, there is another Art for a Cause event. Camille Gibson, an art teacher there, puts it on. It's fantastic. The staff co uh, collaborates, the community collaborates. If you have a chance to go, you should go. I went just this fall. Incidentally, the cause will be autism. I went this fall and the cause was breast cancer. This is what I was able to acquire. And those of you uh, know that one of the greatest things we can do is make students feel good about themselves and we do that just like our parents did, by making a fuss over them. I had a chance to meet the artist. I had a chance to meet mom and uh, the artist's siblings, and I asked the artist if she might be able to autograph the work, and staff went off and found a marker, and she autographed it, and I said, oh, no, no, you have to number it, and she numbered it. <laughs> I'm telling you, if you want to have fun. And speaking of another night of innovation. I went to our Harford Hills, and if you have a chance to go to Harford Hills, you should go. What a wonderful time. Roger says there aren't people speaking proudly or loud about our, or about our schools other than in this room. I respectfully disagree with him, and I extend an invitation to him to join me anytime he wishes to come to schools in our 6th district or near our 6th district, because there's a lot of very, very good things going on. And in the media center, the library, the librarian, and the phys ed teacher were operating devices. And no, these aren't the new ones because there has been no new contract. And they were also working 3D printers. And I couldn't resist the temptation to ask, oh, by the way, might you be able to create a dinosaur with that 3D printer that is not the 21st century? And in fact, they were able to generate a dinosaur using the 3D printer. And if they can do it, you know those kids can do a lot more than create dinosaurs that a couple of adults might be able to generate. Um, and speaking of art, 
I had the opportunity on Saturday to go, and yes, I mean this sincerely, to go to Shepherd Pratt. And it was, uh, I was able to go to the Center for Eating Disorders because there are so many images about our bodies, and these images are also images that are received by our young people, <laughs> how they feel about their bodies, how they see their bodies, what they think about them, and then how they act. And it is both young men and young women who receive these messages, and each of you have received a postcard the art on the postcard was generated by a Perry Hall 10th grader. And I immediately saw it when Kate Clemens, who's a licensed certified social worker there, uh, took me for a tour of all this art generated by our Baltimore County students and other students from private uh, uh, schools. And if you have a chance to participate, you should go and attend these events. And finally, on Sunday, there was this really neat exhibit. And the exhibit was at the Walters Art Gallery. And there were elementary school students there and middle school students and their families. And it was in the lobby of the Walters. And their art was displayed. Now, you go into a museum, most of the people who generate the art are dead. You never get to talk to them and ask them, what was your creative inspiration? Why did you choose these colors? Well, at that event, well attended, Sunday afternoon, you could speak with the artists, their proud families, their grandparents who were equally as proud. If you have the opportunity, I strongly encourage all of you to go. It is so energizing to be with artists in a creative environment. Now, you just say, oh, it's student art. But let me share with you the view of art, the truest form of human expression. Everyone has their own impression. But just down the hallway from the students' work was an exhibit about Fabergé and all the art generated in the jewelry and the Fabergé eggs that uh, Fabergé was known throughout the world for, the scale upon which one could admire art and how we place our students' art on that same level with these recognized world artists. It is truly a positive thing, and I would suggest to my friend, Roger Hayden, to come with me and proudly see it. Thank you. Mrs. Eaton. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Young. I will be briefer than that. <laughs> um, in about a month, we will have spring break or spring weekend, but associated with that are some holidays. So the thing that we should remember is that we're all human and we all make mistakes and we have to live with our mistakes. So with that, I say to everybody, have a good evening and be safe. Thank you. We have, uh, we have the next two Tuesdays for all of you who enjoy following the board around and doing important things. We have a uh, forum next Tuesday at Carver on the characteristics of the new superintendent that uh, are deemed important by our community. And then we have our next meeting on March 20. We're adjourned.